no animal eats the, the variety of plants that we do. And I think that that's causing and driving uh, most of the modern non-communicable chronic diseases that we face these days. It is the complete elimination diet because it gets rid of everything you don't need that could be causing harm. Anthony, what are the biggest mistakes you see people making when they adopt a carnivore diet? Well, sometimes they may misunderstand exactly what we mean by a carnivore diet. Maybe they just think they start they should eat a lot more meat and uh, maybe less of other things, which is great. I think that's a very, very good uh, thing to do. You're going to improve your health a lot. You're going to be getting a lot of nutrients that you uh, may have been deficient in previously, especially when we start eating a lot of fatty meat. The fat's an essential nutrient. It's not just calories. Um, uh, but when when we when people talk about the different results that they get on a carnivore diet, um, it can be quite discouraging when people don't get similar results. And, and one of the ways they won't get those similar results is if they're not doing a similar thing, if they're not actually just eating meat and only drinking water, they're still sort of drinking maybe on the weekends or once a month, or if they're drinking coffee every day or still having some fruits and vegetables and different sorts of things like that, that can you know limit the amount of uh, benefit they get from it. They'll still get a lot of benefit. Just eating clean foods, whole foods, and focusing on meat will, will benefit you a lot. But it makes a huge difference if you really just cut down to bare bones, just meat and just water. I think that makes a huge difference. And another one is just not eating enough in general because your hunger signals can be very very subtle on a carnivore diet. When you eat carbohydrates, it makes us think that we're hungry. It just changes us hormonally and signals our brain that we actually need more energy than we do. And so we, we overeat and we have these very loud hunger signals that are saying, eat, eat, eat. We're starving. We have to eat. And when you get rid of carbohydrates, your insulin goes down and your brain can see it's leptin because insulin blocks leptin. Then you get much more subtle hunger signals. Now you may be hungry, but it's such a such a uh, smaller signal than what it used to be that you, know, you may not actually notice it. And so people easily under eat. And so I think that's something that people need to focus on and understand that that uh, you have to relearn your hunger signals. And one of the best ways of doing that is going by taste. If you're only eating meat and only drinking water, not using any sweeteners or, or carbs or anything like that, then you really can listen to those signals. And if you're getting a, if you if meat tastes good, then you're getting that positive feedback from uh, from that experience. Then I think that's your body telling you that it wants more of that. And the difference between something unhealthy and addictive giving you positive feedback, and something healthy and good for you like meat giving you positive feedback, is that something that's bad for you and addictive will keep giving positive feedback even if you keep doing it. Whereas if something like meat will actually get lower and lower and lower positive feedback until you get no positive feedback. And then your body just says, you know, we actually don't want this anymore. So your taste will be very, uh, will be very indicative of this. It will taste very good. And then it'll taste less good and less good and less good. And eventually you'll get to the point where you're like, hmm, I'm not really enjoying this. I just don't want to eat anymore. And you just naturally stop. So I think people should get to that point, eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. But you shouldn't force yourself. You shouldn't have to, you know, not enjoy your food. Um, but you should keep eating it if you do enjoy it, if that makes sense. And that latter piece there, I'll just jump in real quick before we move on. It seems like when we get the hang of it and we learn the more subtle nuance of our hunger, if we make that switch to a, a primarily meat or an all meat diet, it seems like it'll really simplify things. You know, if you have carbohydrates yeah. in the mix, especially some that are processed, then you kind of need to start looking at how much I'm eating because of that addiction piece and and that hung, hunger signal being thrown askew. Yeah, absolutely. And so it, you know, then you have to get out the calculator and the equations and figure out your macros and your micros and have to, you have to do all that sort of stuff. Well, whereas animals in the wild, they eat intuitively. They eat while things taste good and they know when to stop. You know, they don't have a health coach telling them how to count their macros and how to calculate out their their ins and outs and things like that. They just they just know. And so biologically, we should be able to do that as well. If we're eating what we're designed to eat, and that's a, that's a good sign that we're not eating what we're supposed to eat if we do have to break out the calculators and the equations. So uh, that's what I think is uh, is the amazing thing about, about this is that you can eat intuitively. And that, that goes with our biology because this is biologically what we're designed to eat. 
And so we get these biological signals that just that just work and they just play out. And and you're right, it's it's really the easiest way of eating that there is. You know exactly what you can eat, exactly what you can't eat, right? You just eat meat, you don't eat anything else, right? And you don't have to you don't have to count calories, count macros, limit yourself in any way. You just eat when you're hungry, you eat until you're you're full and and I go by taste so you eat until things stop tasting good so it always tastes good you don't have to eat if it doesn't taste good you know and and people freak out by that because they they're used to eating three times a day or even six times a day with snacks and things like that you don't have to do that I eat once a day naturally I just that's when I'm hungry and I eat until I'm full and then I'm not hungry anymore after that so if you're not hungry and meat doesn't taste good don't eat you also don't have to time it. It was like, well, I need to have this window and in this morning and every two hours and every three and not before bed. You don't have to do any of that. You can eat any time of the day or night, whatever makes you feel good, whatever works for you. I eat generally right before I go uh, to sleep or, or later in the evening anyway. You know, the, the problem with eating later on in the day or closer to bed when we eat traditionally is that you can you can mess with a lot of your hormones in your circadian rhythm, uh, when you eat carbohydrates, your insulin goes up. Insulin blocks the secretion and utilization and action of growth hormone, which is maximally secreted after we go to sleep while we're sleeping. And that's a very important hormone for for aging, repair, and uh, and and regeneration of your body. And you're going to interrupt those actions. And then melatonin also uh, interferes with with uh, insulin. You get all that insulin resistance and things like that. So there's a lot of weird things that go on when you start screwing with your hormones. But when you're just eating meat, you're not going to you're not going to kick off your insulin. You're not going to disrupt the rest of your hormones. It's actually very natural for you to go to sleep after you eat. This is what happens in the wild. You know, an animal takes down a kill. You know, a lion eats a gazelle and then it sleeps for 14 hours. Right, and this is this is a normal thing because you've got a, a, the majority of your well, a large portion of your blood supply going to your digestive tract to digest this food and absorb it and utilize it. So that's not in your brain and your muscles. You're naturally going to be tired and more lethargic, and you go into a rest and digest mode. Your body says, if you think about this uh, from a from just an, uh, a biological standpoint, your your body's giving you energy so you can go out and you can face your day, you can hunt, you can kill, you can mate, you can raise your kids and defend your family. And one of the major things is, is getting food. And when you get your food, you get your your uh, nutrients for the day, your body says, okay, well, hey, let's calm this down. Let's, let's, uh, let's conserve energy and rest and digest. We don't want to waste energy. You waste energy in the wild, you die. And so our bodies are very, very adapted to conserving energy when and where we have to. And, and that's one of them. So you eat a big meal and your body just goes, right, we don't need, we don't need to go around hunting and, and chasing after things. Let's just, let's just chill out. And so you naturally want to go to sleep. And so, um, yeah, so it's very, very easy. It's very intuitive and you can just listen to your body. That is so fascinating, that piece of eating right before bed, because when it comes to sleep and the different people I've interviewed over the years on the show, it's a one-on-one type thing where you at least give a few hours before bed when you have that last meal to digest before going to sleep. So even in the carnivore community, which isn't a community that I'm, you know, I've just started to dig a little bit deeper and deeper into, but it's not something I've heard. So I think a good place to go at this point is talk about a typical day. The way you explained it there is you typically have one meal a day and it's later in the day before bed. Let's get into specifics. How close to bed? What might be in that meal? And and let's get into the nuances here. Well, it, it depends on my my day really and how, how busy I am. I When I get up in the morning, I don't need breakfast. I generally don't. And if I'm hungry, you know, I'll, I'll have something, but I, I, I just listen to my body. Uh, I generally don't feel like having breakfast. I just get up, you know, take a shower, go to work, um, feel great. Don't need to stop for lunch. Just can keep going and, uh, and, and feel great the whole day. And then I don't slow down and feel rotten towards the end of the day. And like, Oh, I have to eat something. I never get, I never get hangry or, or, uh, you know, wrecked because I, I'm not able to eat. And, you know, then if I'm able to, I'll, I'll do a workout and then come home. And at that point, you know, might cook a big, a big steak or something like that and eat until I'm full. 
and then do whatever I need to do and then go to bed. If I'm on call and it's busy and I don't have a chance to get home and get a meal, I, I may not actually get uh, to eat that night. And sometimes, you know, it might be you know, in surgery and just thinking like, man, a steak sounds really good right now. But uh, in my head, I'm like, well, this surgery is going to take five hours and I've got another one after that. And then I'm starting my day at six. And so, you know, probably not going to be able to eat until tomorrow night. And my body just goes, okay, we're not going to bug you about it because it can see my leptin. It knows that I'm not starving. It knows I have fat reserves. And so it just, those that panic goes away. I don't, I don't, I don't have to eat, you know, because none of us have to eat, uh, unless we're extraordinarily emaciated. No one in the West is, is getting to that point unless, you know, they have some sort of, you know, severe eating disorder and anorexia or, or very impoverished. But, you know, even in, um, you know, we have a lot of programs and food stamps and things like that. Whereas actually, you know, people in poor economical, uh, socioeconomical, um, uh, categories in the quintile, lowest quintile, actually has is o- is more overweight than other quintiles. So uh, there isn't there is uh, an abundance of energy around. So none of us are going to starve for missing one meal or even not eating for one day, um, by and large. And so because I can just see my signals, my my brain knows what's going on. I don't I don't get panicked. I don't get worried, and I just go. Um, but normally I would eat. When I get home, whenever that may be, if I have you know, interviews or, or things like that, I'd, I'd probably wait until after that and then I'd have a steak and if it's right before bed, I'll go to bed. If it's not, then I'll, I'll keep working or doing whatever, read, and then go to bed after that. But I generally, when, I, when I'm done with my day, with my work day and workout, that's when I'll have like a big steak. If I'm, if I'm working out regularly, if I actually have the time to, uh, my, my hunger signals will go up. My demand for energy and protein and fat will go up. And so I generally eat about twice as much. So at the moment, I eat about two pounds a day of very fatty meat like ribeye. And that seems to be just right for me to maintain me where I'm at, which I don't know, it seems like a little, not that all that much because I, you know, I'm six foot three, I'm 235, 40 pounds. And so, you know, uh, I, I know like smaller women that like eat more than that, you know, but it's, but they might be coming from a point where they're, they're healing and they, they, their body needs those nutrients to catch up a bit. And I've been doing this for a very long time. So I'm just sort of in a steady state, but when I'm working out a lot, I, I probably double that. I'll probably eat about four pounds a day. And so I have to eat during the day. And so I'll, you know, make a steak and cut it up into chunks and, take that to work or something like that. But if I'm eating during the day because of that lethargy that you can get directly after eating, I try to eat like not as much as I want. I just, just sort of a half meal just to take the edge off. Uh, but not enough. My body goes like, okay, well we can just, we can just take a nap and sleep for 14 hours. Now it's, you know, it, my brain's still going, okay, well that was fine, but that's not enough. You need to go like, you know, kill something, you know, <laughs> so here's, you know, so I'll still have energy and, um, yeah, so that's a normal, normal day for me. Right now, the latest YouTube stats are showing that over 90% of the people that are watching this channel aren't subscribed. If you're one of these people and you've been enjoying the episodes, please take a second and subscribe below. This is going to help the community continue to grow and help the show continue to bring on the biggest guests. Thank you ahead of time. Continue to enjoy this episode with Anthony. You mentioned the energy piece, and that's where I wanted to go next. I'm curious because this is such a unique diet, and I know you've been doing it for quite a while, so you might not recall, but... How is your energy throughout the day eating this way? And do you find after you have that big meal, it sounds like what you're alluding to here, it does slow you down a bit, but talk about your energy through 24 hours and, and where you see it dip. Well, my, my energy is fantastic all the time. I, I don't have problems with energy. I don't drink coffee. I don't take caffeine. I don't have it. I actually feel better when I don't, you know, you'll get, you'll get a bit of a, a, of a boost for a few hours if you take that. But then you have a crash afterwards, and I find that my, my energy levels are horrible after that. I feel I feel gross, almost like feel like I'm coming off it like hungover or something like that. It's 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 not a nice feeling. And then I sleep terribly that night. It, it caffeine is much stronger <laughs> for me now. I'll take you know maybe if I were to have I mean I don't know I I don't even know the last time I've had coffee it was it was a few years ago but the last time I did I you know had that big 
spike in the morning and, you know, went throughout my day. And then it was like two in the morning and I'm just wired and awake and just like, God, I just can't wind down. And I was like, oh, that's stupid caffeine. So I was, I was still wired, uh, even though I was wired, but tired sort of thing. Uh, otherwise I don't get that. I, I used to be a horrible sleeper. I used to have, it, it was very difficult for me to get to sleep, which was a really difficult thing when you're a doctor on call and like you need to, you need to catch sleep in these 20 minute bursts before your pager goes off and you get called into the next thing. And, and it would, it would take me 20 minutes to go to sleep and I just start falling asleep and then I get another call. I'm like, damn it. So that was that that was difficult, but now I sleep very well. I can get to sleep very easily, and I stay asleep, and I get better quality sleep. So that's very good. And then if I take caffeine, obviously it it ruins that. Um, but I find I have much better consistent energy throughout the day, just normally with, with if I don't take any of that stuff. And it's it's one of those things that. I, I didn't even know how much of an advantage that would be. I didn't know how much of a difference that would make until I was in it doing it. I can, you know, my, my intern year as a doctor, I was, you know, there's some weeks I was doing 105 hours a week to 120 hours a week and, uh, consistently week after week, after week, after week, no, no days off, you know, you'll get a weekend off and then restart. This is Monday through Sunday and then you do it again. So you're just, just going and going and going. And, just working around the clock and it was, it was miserable. I absolutely hated it. It was just, it was just making me, uh, miserable and sick. And, uh, now I'm working similar hours, maybe even more because now I have similar hours at the hospital. Uh, if, if I'm, if it, there's a lot of heavy on call, um, which is not always the top the case, but you know, it's fairly regularly. We have quite heavy on call schedule and it's generally very busy. And so we don't really get any rest. And we don't go home post call. We have to work the whole next day. So you might be working all day, then all night, then all day again. And most weekends I work like six days a week. I work at the hospital, but then on my if I have a day off or something like that on on the weekend, I actually have a, a, a private practice in functional medicine and metabolic health, sort of preventative medicine. And so I work seven days a week, no matter what. It's either at the hospital or it's at the hospital and the clinic. And then in the evenings. If I'm not on call and at the hospital, I'm I'm doing this sort of stuff and then trying to get get the, the podcast and the videos and things like that out there. So I I, I work pretty much every waking hour of the day and uh, with not much leisure time, and um, I'm fine. You know, I feel great. Uh, my energy levels are consistent. You know, even if I don't get much sleep, I'm I'm good the next day, and that's that's a night and day difference to I think me throughout my entire life before this and most people uh, around now most people are, are chronically fatigued chronically tired chronically worn down and you know and it's it, it really gets to them and i think that's a, a a direct product of not eating the right things and not putting the right things in their body so throughout our talk now we're getting a pretty good idea of what your diet looks like you talked about the timing of a typical day we know fatty meat is is the primary and we know the baseline is meat and water. I think before we move on, let's really hash out what carnivore is because there's still some variability there. Are you taking any supplements? Do you put any spices or salt on the meat? Let's get really nuanced here and talk about what you're eating and what you're drinking. Yeah, so I, I don't take any supplements. I don't take any anything like that. Um, I don't think you need to. I've, I've checked all my my blood counts, all my micronutrients are all in optimal levels, which is different than to say they're in the reference ranges because the reference ranges are not optimal for our health. Those are the averages for the community. The first 2,000 or so people that come into a clinic every year and get these blood tests, that's that's the reference range because it's a reference of, of the community. That's what they're calling normal when it's the norm, but it's not necessarily normal because 90% of uh, you know Americans are have at least one metabolic issue and 70% of Americans are overweight or obese and everyone else is close behind or actually worse than that. You know, America is not the worst, worst one, uh, by a long shot. Actually, I think we're number 20 for overweight and obese, uh, people, um, in the world. So we're up there, but we're not, we're not number one. So there are people that are worse and, and everyone else is close behind. So people are, are unwell and people, cr you know, chronically have, nutrient deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies. And this is why supplements are, are such a big market now. And so 
when I look at blood work of, of my patients and myself, I look at different reference ranges. We look at reference ranges that have been ca- calculated for people, you know, men and women in their mid twenties who have no medical issues. And those are very different reference ranges. And so that's sort of like the ideal health, you know, that's when you're at your peak, uh, in your, in your health and what should be at a peak health, uh, in your life. And so my, my blood results and my magnesium and zinc and vitamin D and B12 and all these things are in that range, in that range of, of, uh, what you would expect in a healthy 25 year old say, and it's just eating meat. And, you know, they say, well, we don't have all the micronutrients. You don't have all these different things. Well, I do because I'm getting them and my, my blood results, uh, show exactly that and that they're in optimal ranges. You know, if you have to take supplements, then by definition, your diet is deficient, right? Um, uh, so it can't be something that you're designed to eat. You know, koalas don't take vitamins. They don't count their macros. They just, they just eat eucalyptus leaves and they get everything that they need. And so we should be able to do that as well. Now there's differences in, you know, soil health and, and the nutrient content and, and that, and that's, that's a real issue. Um, but when people are just eating store-bought meat, just, you know, Safeway meat, uh, Costco meat, they, they don't have these nutrient deficiencies, uh, by and large. Some people, maybe they need to eat a bit, bit of liver or something like that, but most people don't. Most people just, just eat, uh, normal muscle meat. I generally just eat steaks. So like 99% of what I eat are, are beef steaks and I'll have other meats as well. I don't you know, have a problem with fish or chicken or pork or lamb, anything like that. But what I, what I feel best eating and what tastes best to me is beef. And so that's what I stick with generally. Um, I just salt, just lightly salt. I don't I use a whole bunch of salt. Uh, I don't take le- electrolytes. I don't, uh, season things really. I like. I really like the taste of meat and I, and I find that people, as they get going on this, they start appreciating the taste of meat more and more and they don't, and they want less and less spices and, and seasonings. Um, and also these are, these are things that can have strong flavors and also that's, you know, and that strong flavor can indicate that there's a chemical in there that your body's trying to warn you against that strong flavor. You know, if you just, you know, bite into a chili pepper, it's going, Oh my God, you 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 have this visceral reaction saying, Hey, there's something in here that maybe I shouldn't eat, that this is a bad experience. And your brain and your tongue are sophisticated machines and they can identify harmful compounds and they give you a reaction saying, this is bad, spit it out. Very bitter tasting things uh, are, are of that nature. And so I think it's, I think it's just as important, you know, it's important to eat meat and eat fatty meat. That's very good for you. It's very important for your health. And so we need to eat that we need to eat a lot more of it than than people think and that's good that gives you your energy that gives you your nutrients that gives you what you need to survive but i think it's it's just as important what not to eat as what to eat and because there are a lot of things that we eat that can actually cause harm and, and damage to our body this isn't a new concept you know we've we've said that cholesterol causes heart disease and diabetes and things like that it does not it absolutely does not carbohydrates alcohol sugar you know, seed oils probably play a role in there as well. But, you know, that concept of, you know, people that eat a lot of processed food and junk food and, and sugary cakes and all that sort of stuff, they have, they have poorer health outcomes than other people. That's a concept that people generally understand. So there are things that you can eat that are harming you. And the main, the mainstay of a carnivore diet and the reason why you, you just want to eat meat is because plants defend themselves chemically. They don't have legs to run away from you. They don't have you know, uh, teeth. They can't bite you. Uh, they can have thorns. They can have bristles. They can have bark and wood and things like that to protect them. But they they are static. They can't run away. They they aren't. They don't have kinetic defenses like an animal who can run away or fight back or hide or something like that. So they have to have other means of defenses. And one of the, the mainstays in, in the defense in the uh, botanical world is is by using chemical agents to disrupt the physiology and and life of animals eating it. A lot of the plants are the, the great chemists of the world. They make about a million different uh, chemicals most of which are used to defend themselves from animals and insects because they are the dominant life form on earth. About 99% of life on earth are plants. And so 
you know, they have to have robust defenses because they're under constant assault by animals and insects. And so they have a lot of these chemical defenses. They can disrupt your digestion. They can block nutrient absorption. They can disrupt your hormones, make it so you, you can't reproduce. They can uh, be directly toxic and, and damage your cells, damage your respiration, damage utilization of, of oxygen. They, uh, you know, um, hemlock, North American uh, water hemlock. It's the most poisonous plant in North America. Uh, half a leaf of that can kill you by blocking the GABA receptors in your brain that don't allow your brain to sort of calm down the excitation of your neurons. So you go, you start having seizures and you can't stop having seizures and you die within minutes. So these are the ways that, that plants defend themselves. And so you, you actually want to avoid these things because they can have these chemicals in there that can harm you. And we know this intuitively. You get lost in the woods, you run out of food, you can't just eat any random plant, right? Most of them will cause harm, they cause you to get sick, and, and many will actually kill you if you eat enough of it. Um, and then, you know, obviously, there are plants that we deem edible that don't have that huge, acute, you know, life-threatening response with a few leaves, but that doesn't mean that they don't have any defense chemicals. That doesn't mean that they're completely benign. And so if you're looking for optimal health, you know, you want to avoid these things completely. So I think that it's important to not eat these things as as much as it is important to eat enough meat. So my rule for myself is no plants, no sugar or any sweeteners, nothing artificial. And that goes for sauces, seasonings, and drinks as well, and any ingredients that would be on a packet. So really, I just just eating whole food, meat, and just drinking water, I think is the best best way to do it. So I don't I don't really go in for spices and sauces and, and anything like that. And if you just do that, you'll you'll find that your body works ex extraordinarily well, and a lot of little issues or even big issues that you didn't really realize was were. Uh, attributable to what you are eating, uh, go away. I mean, there's a number of people that are, that are finding this for autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases just melt away. Our body is reacting to different things that we're eating. We're causing an immune response and antibody response. And then, then some people who are genetically susceptible have cross reaction of those antibodies with parts of their, their own tissue and it's damaging them. And, and we've actually, it's in the medical literature, we've been treating autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, like Crohn's, like gout or, you know, gout, not autoimmune, but, you know, things like gout and ulcerative colitis. Since the 1800s, by putting people on a pure red meat and water diet, and this was this was known and, and books written about this going up until 1975 by Dr. Volklin, who wrote a book called The Stone Age Diet. He's a gastroenterologist. And, uh, and then 1977 came along, USDA said, you know, cholesterol causes heart disease, stop eating it. And we just, we just threw out a hundred years of, of medical literature, but you can still see this in the literature now, uh, for Crohn's in particular, we know that there are studies. If you put someone on an elemental diet, which is just a, it's highly processed. It's like a, it's like a drink sort of thing, like a powder scoop. It's just nutrients. It's nothing else. You put someone on that and that's a better treatment for uh, acute flare-up of Crohn's, it gets them out of and a flare-up of Crohn's quicker than prednisone or prednisolone, like a steroid, this, which is like the gold standard. This is this is the heaviest drug we have to get someone out of acute flare-up where they're having bloody diarrhea 20, 30 times a day. It's, it's horrible pain. Just not eating those things is better treatment than the best pharmacological intervention. There's another uh, study that was a controlled trial where you eliminate out uh, they eliminated out carbohydrates and fiber from the diet of Crohn's patients, and they stayed in remission on average 51 months. So that's over four years on average. And then contrast that with control group who didn't remove carbs and, and fiber, and they stayed in remission on average zero months. So it was a big contrast. There's a big difference. And what does that suggest? It suggests that there's something in the carbs and the fiber that were precip that was precipitating this autoimmune reaction and response. And so you find that you have all these issues. And I know people with MS, there, there are even you know, uh, uh, reports of people with Huntington's reducing their symptoms of Huntington's, which is 
crazy. I thought I thought that was purely genetic, but apparently people are having improvements. Ehlers Danlos, who is his, uh, uh, connective tissue disorder, they have hypermobile joints. I have three patients right now with Ehlers Danlos, and uh, you know, one gentleman every morning he woke up, he had a different joint or two out of out of alignment. His shoulder would be out of socket, his knee would be out of joint, S- his fingers would just be crooked sideways every morning. He'd have to realign his joints, and uh, a few months into a carnivore diet, he doesn't have he hasn't had a single joint dislocation. So there's something to do with that as well. You're giving your body more collagen. You don't have to make faulty collagen. Uh, you just have the the proper building blocks there ready available for you. And it, it seems, that, and that's why you don't even have to go full carnivore for that. Just eating a lot more meat and, and cutting out the carbs and sugar seem to help that significantly. So there, it's a it's a dramatic difference. Uh, that people can make in their lives. It's not subtle. It's it's a huge, huge difference in benefit to people's lives. And I think a, a lot of that is A, eating enough of the right thing, but I think very importantly, eliminating all these things that can cause direct harm. Th- last example, type 2 diabetes has been shown in clinical, in large clinical uh, controlled trials to be reversible on a ketogenic diet. I mean, you eliminate carbohydrates type 2 diabetes goes away. What does that mean? That means that the carbohydrates are causing type 2 diabetes, right? So this isn't a a disease. This is a toxicity, right? You're you're getting chronic low-grade toxic exposure from something and it's it's degrading your body over time and and you're having these sorts of medical responses. So you treat those differently. You don't treat those with pills. Maybe you treat them with pills to to sort of help mitigate the symptoms. But the treatment for a toxic exposure is to remove the exposure. If you're getting lead poisoning, it's going to cause end organ damage, damage your brain, damage your other organs. And so, yes, maybe you need some sort of support there or chelating agent. But the number one thing you do is you get rid of the lead exposure. And that's what we need to uh, recognize as doctors. I think there's a lot of layers that keep people locked in and keep them continuing to, for lack of a better word, poison their body over time. And you've touched on this, but I want to make sure we elaborate. There's different kinds of stressors on the body. You mentioned the hemlock that'll kill you right away versus some of these other plant toxins that are in fruits and vegetables that you get at the grocery store that are more of a chronic low exposure over a period of time and people don't feel it right away. So they they continue to hammer their body over a period of time and then get a chronic disease years down the line and not realize necessarily where that's coming from. And it just sneaks, it, it appears just to sneak up on people. So there's a lot of different reasons why I think people are being duped by these plant toxins. And I think that's a big piece of it. Yeah. And and that's the thing, you know, slow poison is still poison. It can take time. It can take a long time. It can take years to build up, but it, but it does. And most people, it will cause, you know, just, just a general feeling of not feeling your best, not the best energy. Maybe you're difficult to, to, you know, get rid of that spare tire or, you know, maintain your youthful body fat percentage. Uh, and, and for others, it'll be much more pronounced. They'll be much more sensitive to this, uh, this exposure and they'll get cystic acne and they'll get a hormonal deficient uh, interruptions, the PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a leading cause of infertility, um, in the Western world and, or for female, um, uh, driven, uh, infertility anyway. And, uh, autoimmune issues and heart disease and diabetes and and even uh, cancers are are uh, now being well they've actually been been uh, described as a mitochondrial disease as opposed to a genetic disease a hundred years ago by Nobel Prize winner Otto Warburg who who did decades of work on cancer and the mitochondria and uh, wrote his seminal work in 1951 called the Origins of Cancer where he shows that every cancer cell. Uh, in every tumor has dysfunctional mitochondria and they're damaged and they can't work properly. And this is, this is the problem because mitochondria are what stop your cell from dividing out of control. They're also what are involved in uh, apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So your body says, okay, well, the cell says, hey, th- something's wrong here. We got to shut this down. Uh, it's the mitochondria that action that. And so when the mitochondria aren't uh, you know, functional, they, 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 there's no kill switch. 
And so that's a, that's a hallmark of cancer is it's uncontrolled, unregulated cell growth and an inability to shut itself down. And that that's all run by the mitochondria. And so uh, and people can read his work, read the work of uh, Dr. Thomas Seyfried, who has over 150 uh, published peer reviewed uh, papers and studies on the subject of cancer biology and and uh, and I've you know I've studied biology he teaches cancer biology um, and it really does appear that this is this is more mitochondrially driven and you know you eat a lot of these things and it damages your mitochondria it damages the function of mitochondria just eating a lot of carbohydrates can cause a dysfunction and dysregulation of your mitochondria just having high insulin can prevent your body from going through you know people uh, in the you know, sort of health and wellness sort of space doctors and and, and clinicians and and whomever you know, talk about, you know, maybe fasting for autophagy, letting your body sort of clear out these older cells or maybe just not, not as functional. And, but you can also go through mitophagy where you, you replace these older mitochondria when your insulin is high, you know, it's, it's stopping all of that. And so, uh, you need to fast and, and get this stuff out of your system, or you just go on a ketogenic diet, which a carnivore diet is, I think it's the ultimate ketogenic diet. And it uh, it allows your body to sort of get back to normal workings. And within a couple of months, uh, there are studies that show that just going on a ketogenic diet um, really benefits your the health of your mitochondria. And so they increase the number of mitochondria, quadruple the number of mitochondria, and quadruple the efficacy. So it's four times the mitochondria, and they work four times as well. So that's a massive, massive, massive boost in your productivity and the function of your of your cells and your mitochondria in general you know even even implicated in uh, psychiatric disorders um, like schizophrenia major depression bipolar OCD uh, ADHD even autism these are now being uh, argued that these are mitochondrial disorders they've actually been argued for 20 years to be mitochondrial disorders uh, now it's really getting a, a big push especially from professor uh, Chris Palmer from Harvard. He's a professor of uh, psychiatry there, uh, who I've had on my podcast as well. And he, he wrote a book called brain energy. And he really argues this is a mitochondrial disease. And when you, when you fix me the metabolic health and the mitochondrial health, you can actually reverse schizophrenia. So he's actually clinically reversing schizophrenia, major depression, anxiety, crippling anxiety, and OCD, bipolar. You can even really augment and help someone with with autism, even as an adult. If you if you approach it as a child, though, they still have room to develop, and they can actually undo uh, some of the damage that has been caused by this misdevelopment. And uh, but it but it helps uh, pretty much everyone. So there are just a number of different. Uh, benefits that that eating this way uh, can give you that, that most people are just completely unaware of and it just builds up over time and we have these things described as diseases and we try to treat diseases and we don't have very good treatments for them psychiatric diseases in, in particular <clears throat> only about 10 percent of people respond really well to medications and then sort of half the rest of them are you know uh, middling sort of response and for many people, it doesn't does really doesn't work at all. You only get the side effects. You don't get good effects, and that's and that can be the case for a lot of things. And so we're we're sort of in a disease management system now, where we're just sort of mitigating the symptoms of different diseases. We're not addressing the root cause of diseases, and a lot of these have to do with our mitochondria and our metabolic health, and that is in large part being damaged by the food we're eating. We're not eating what we're biologically designed to eat. All animals need to eat a very specific diet, what they are biologically designed to eat. This is why you have signs at the zoo that say, don't feed the animals. It makes them very sick. Don't feed the animals the thing that you're eating right now that's making you sick. It makes them sick, so don't eat it. You, know, you should also say, just don't eat it. Don't eat what you're eating and don't feed it to the animals as well. You know, Any zookeeper will tell you, if you feed an animal something that it doesn't eat in the wild, something that it didn't evolve on, it gets very sick. But what does it get sick with? It gets obesity, heart disease, liver disease, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune issues, all uh, and uh, um, you know arthritis and things like that. Um, dogs and cats, known carnivores, and yet we give them grain and plant based kibble. And veterinarians are now saying that there's this large rise in so called human diseases in domestic animals. Um, okay, well these are non communicable diseases, right? So you can't pass you can't pass arthritis on to a dog, you know, I can't pass diabetes on to my cat, you know, and so, or cancer for that matter. So something's, something's rising, uh, something's causing this to rise. 
And as we have increased the prevalence of feeding them things that they don't normally eat, they're not biologically designed to eat, you're seeing these diseases go up. And zookeepers, well, I, I've actually spoken to one, you know, I've asked him, do you guys ever give, you know, kibble or grain or this and the other? And he's like, are you crazy? They'll get human diseases if you give them that crap. And so, and, and use that word, human diseases, right? So these aren't, these aren't human diseases. These aren't even diseases at all. These are, these are chronic exposure to something that we are not biologically designed to eat. And they're not biologically designed to eat. Dogs and cats are not di- uh, biologically designed to eat. Food is very specific in the animal kingdom. You eat very, very, well, in all life in general, is very specific. You know, animals that eat plants for their whole life, they don't eat any random plant. They eat extremely specific plants. There are 340,000 plants in the world. Koalas eat one. Pandas eat one. Cows, horses, grazing animals, they eat grass. That's it. And they eat different kinds of grass. They eat specific grasses or they get very sick. The leaves that a giraffe eats are different from the leaves that a gorilla eats. Those are different from the leaves that a deer eats and so on. And you mix those leaves around, they all get sick or die. So they have to eat very specific things. We are the only animals on earth that eat such a wide variety of foods. Uh, No animal eats the, the variety of plants that we do. And I think that that's causing and driving uh, most of the modern non-communicable chronic diseases that we face these days. You made it really clear there that at least part of the root of all these different diseases is the mitochondria and metabolic health. Do we know what might be even further upstream than metabolic health and the mitochondria or something else that's in that same realm that's being affected by this diet that is impacting in such a positive way so many different conditions? Well, metabolic health and the mitochondria are, are certainly a big part of that. And we're finding that that many of these chronic diseases are, you know, exactly that from dysfunction and dysregulation of the mitochondria um, to different degrees and, to, and in different ways. And the genetically susceptible and the right uh, you know, perfect storm sort of conditions, you're going to get, you know, a certain disease. Um, but it's not just the mitochondria because this this can disrupt so many different workings in your body and you know even that that the idea that autoimmune conditions are a response and an immune driven reaction to something that's getting into your body maybe you get uh, you know you there's a lot of these different lectins or which are toxins in plants um that can bind to our uh to to carbohydrates you have this sort of glycocalyx that is is sort of this uh, or glycobiome that uh are a bunch of of carbohydrate Protein, proteins and carbohydrates that sort of stick out on the on the surface of cells, and some of these things have carbohydrates, and this can bind to those carbohydrates, damage them, disrupt them, damage the cells, damage the, the tight junctions in between the cells in your in your uh, intestinal lining, and so now it's actually this open airway. So instead of these cells blocking off things from coming in, now there's actually like an open gate, and things can sort of seep in and get into your body and your blood uh, bloodstream. Uh, that is not that are not supposed to be there, and your body can react to this and, and have an immune response. This is, you know, have an inflammatory reaction. So people are saying, "Oh, we have want anti-inflammatories." We do. Everyone's inflamed. Everyone's having all these problems. Well, part of that is because we're letting things into our body that we don't want in our body, and our on our immune system responds to this. Our cytokines, you know, rise up and 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 try to fight this and contain this stuff from uh, you know disrupting our normal workings. And so we can make antibodies to this, and those antibodies in, in the genetically susceptible can go and attack other things. I mean, I don't, as far as I know, I don't have the genes for Crohn's disease. I've never experienced that anyway. And so, you know, me eating these sorts of things aren't aren't going to give me that, but in the genetically susceptible, they can get that. Or something, someone with Huntington's, they have the gene for Huntington's, you know, by and large, you know, I, I understood this to be a very high penetrance, meaning that if you had the gene that you were very likely to get the disease. Um, but it seems for some reason people go on, on a carnivore diet and they're actually helping their symptoms of this. I think that's amazing. This is anecdotal. Obviously, this is just this is just people's experiences, but that's really all that matters to that person. You know, does it work or not? Is it helping me or not? Am I am I is my brain degenerating, my body degenerating? And am I am I going to die soon? And in these cases, no, they aren't, and they're getting better. So that's very important. So there's there's a number of different things that this can disrupt in your body. I mean, autism, for example, um, you know, there, there are going to be 
issues with uh, malnutrition and malabsorption and uh, and other things that can disrupt our body as well. So in autism, there was a there was a, there was research out of University uh, or Texas A and M uh, in in America, and they found that a type of autism could be caused by a carnitine deficiency. Most people make carnitine. Uh, we consider this a non-essential amino acid, meaning that we make it. We don't have to have it from our diet. But there are plenty of studies showing that even people in people that make carnitine, eating more carnitine actually is beneficial in a number of different ways. But either way, only about 70% of people actually make enough carnitine that they don't need it in their diet. And some people don't make any carnitine at all, right? So that's actually a big proportion. You know, 30% need carnitine in some form, in some amount in their, in their diet, be it a large amount or a small amount. Well, carnitine as, as the Latin root, you know, carne, carnivore, carnitine, this comes from meat, right? And so it doesn't exist in plants. It doesn't exist in, in, in fungi. And so you, you have to get it from meat. Now it exists in most animal products, most dairy, most meat, but a, a lot of it you get in red meat. And so what's the first thing that vegetarians do? They drop red meat because that's the worst, right? Well, actually, it's the best. And then, you know, vegans who don't eat any plant or animal products at all, uh, they're not, they're not getting any exposure to carnitine. So if your, if your kid has a deficiency in making carnitine, even to a small extent, and you're not eating any carnitine, any meat or animal product, you know, you, they might ex- exhibit this uh, misdevelopment of their neurons. It actually carnitine is, is very important for your mitochondria as well. And so, but it's an integral for the development of the neurons and the mitochondria in the neurons that are then have this knock on effect of, of not developing your neurons properly and specific neurons. And so then you can develop or have a misdevelopment of your brain cells and, and, and we would call that autism. And so, you know, and vegetarians, maybe their kid don't make any uh, carnitine at all. And if they're not eating like the red meat, maybe they really do need the red meat. So this is, this is a part of why autism rates are going up because historically most people, if you could afford it, would eat meat and they'd eat meat whenever they could, if they could afford it, because they, they understood that this was very important and healthy. And so we didn't really see it as often, but now the rise in vegetarianism, veganism, and the vilification of meat over the past 40, 50 years plus has has put us into a state where more and more people are trying these plant only diets and then the genetically susceptible they're not they're getting this this malnutrition mal uh, uh, well malnutrition in general uh, and they're getting problems thereof so i think that you know the majority of these metabolic issues or call them chronic diseases these non communicable diseases that we're treating as a mainstay of modern medicine, I don't think are diseases per se. I think they're toxicities and malnutrition, toxic buildup of a species inappropriate diet and a lack of species specific nutrition, right? And so too many plants that we haven't evolved to break down appropriately and we can't get the requisite nutrients from and not enough meat, which we get all all of our bioavailable micro and macronutrients from. And I'm not saying that there are no nutrients in plants, of course there are, but there is not a complete complement of nutrients in plants. And, uh, and there are many micronutrients that we aren't even aware of that are in meat that, that, uh, won't likely won't exist in plants, but there's nothing that we have to have, uh, in plants that we cannot get from meat, but there are a number of things that we have to have that's in, that are in meat that we cannot get from plants. So you have to have meat. If you want to eat plants as well, you know, that's up to you. But you don't have to, and and there's a lot of reasons why you don't want to. One of them is just because they they have these toxins, they have these different enzymes and and proteins and things like that that can cause harm, but also because they have uh, dis, uh, um, digestive disruptors. They have proteus inhibitors, like in wheat and soy. They they get in the way of your body breaking down protein properly and absorbing it effectively. So even if you're eating that with meat, you're eating a sandwich, uh, you know, with whole wheat bread or something like that, the proteus inhibitors can actually block the, uh, the breakdown and absorption of the very bioavailable protein that that's in meat. 
and the fiber can actually act as a, as a blockage well, can actually interrupt and, de and uh, delay absorption or actually prevent absorption of, of all these different nutrients. So, uh, you know, you can get nutrient deficiencies. There's quite a lot of calcium that's in spinach, but because of the high oxalate content in spinach, there's actually been studies done decades ago showing that when, when you eat a lot of spinach or you give spinach to, you know, uh, animals and things like that, and they're expecting their calcium to go up. They're saying, oh, this is a good source of calcium. Actually, the calcium goes down because the oxalates are actually binding calcium and, and going out. You get calcium oxalate stones this is like 70, something like 75% of kidney stones are calcium oxalate stones around that anyway. And so, you know, we know this as doctors, you generally put people on low oxalate diets if they are getting chronic kidney stones and this, this helps. And so, um, and there's, there's other, other things as well. There, there's different ways that plants just bind up their nutrients in different ways. So they're not bioavailable. That's where that term come from. Is this available to us? We eat this, it has calcium and it, it has iron in it, but are we getting anything from it? In a lot of plants, the answer is no, or at least a, to a diminished uh, amount, you know, because they're bound up in ways to try and stop animals from being able to get anything good out of it. There, you know, there's a ton of niacin in corn, but if you don't chemically treat it and put it through a process called nishtamalization, which is what the Mesoamericans used to do uh, before uh, Europeans, uh, you know, uh, found them, uh, you cannot access the niacin. So there's actually the niacin deficiency is called pellagra. And there was a wave of pellagra that was killing millions of people around the world because they were it was generally very poor people because corn was very cheap. It was easy to grow. And so they, they subsisted mostly on corn and they were dying of niacin deficiencies. The irony being there's a ton of niacin in corn. It's just not accessible by us. And that again goes into the biological um, biological nature and what we're biologically designed to eat. If we can't access these nutrients, we're clearly not biologically designed to eat them, right? If you have to put something through a chemical process, if you have to cook it to, to denature the lectins so that they don't kill you, which, you know, five kidney beans uh, uncooked can put you in the hospital, can put an adult in the hospital and has, the WHO has, has reported on that. Um, if you have to put something through a chemical process, to detoxify it or to unlock some of the nutrients, well, then that means that you don't have the physiology to detoxify it and get out those nutrients safely. So by definition, we are not designed to eat those sorts of things. And so, you know, there's there's probably a lot of different reasons why these different chemicals, because I mean, there's a million of them, you know, so there's a lot of different things, that, different ways that they disrupt our body and, and damage our health. Um, and so, and it's interesting to go into that and, and look at specifics. A lot of it has to do with mitochondria and damaging that, but whatever is happening, you know, it's happening because we're eating something we're not designed to eat. And so if I think we just go to first principles and just eat what we're designed to eat and all the best evidence shows that that's meat, and fatty meat, and that's what our ancestors have been eating throughout the ice ages. There weren't plants available throughout the ice ages, generally, especially. I mean, where are the Inuits and and uh, you know northern Canadians? Where, where's the where are the crops up on the ice flows? You know, there, there are none. They're eating meat, and they traditionally eat meat. Now you can you can ship in uh, you know different sorts of garbage food, but the traditional food was meat. They didn't have access to other things, and so you know that we know is is something that we can get everything from we can get everything we need in the proportion that we need it and so i just i just stick to that and you know maybe and, and there are many things that are, work very subtly right that may not damage you until 60 years down the road and you know oh gosh who cares i care i, I want my body to work perfectly all the time and so i even subtle things that don't have that big of effect on me. I don't want them in my body. And, um, you know, other people can make their own decisions, of course, but that's just what I've chosen to do. And I feel great for it. You've named a number of the different toxins that affect us negatively from the plants. And I know there are countless. I've heard you talk on another interview of, I think it was a hundred and something that were identified in Brussels sprouts. So it's like, there's so many of them. We could never go into all of them during this conversation, but you've covered a lot of the big ones, including oxalates, lectins, and uh, protease, what was it? Protease inhibitors. Oh, protease inhibitors, yeah. Yeah, so, and you've gone over so many different ones, but any other big ones people want to be aware of? I know gluten's a big one that people are cognizant of. How do you feel about gluten and any other big ones that we didn't talk about? Well, well gluten, gluten is a lectin. 
And so that that's one of the lectins. So there, there are thousands of different kinds of lectins, and there are there are lectins actually in in uh, you know animal derived lectins as well, but they don't seem to cause any health issues uh, to us anyway. Um, but there are a number of different lectins. You know, ricin is a lectin. You know, this is the, some people may have heard of this. This is from the, the husk of a of castor beans. You know, we you press the castor bean and get castor oil. This is a laxative that people use for centuries, and and what's left over, you can sort of get out of there. Is, is this lectin uh, called uh, ricin, which is the most poisonous thing known to man? One microgram, so one millionth of a gram per kilogram of body weight is enough to kill you or pretty much any other animal. Maybe there's something that's evolved to, to, to eat it safely and break it down, but, uh, it definitely kills us. And so there are uh, a number of different kinds of lectins. They do a number of different horrible things in your body. Um, and, uh, phytic acid is another one They can bind to different, uh, to different, uh, um, minerals and things like that, you know, like calcium, magnesium, zinc, and they, it makes it so we can't access this. Um, it was there was someone who tried to who I mentioned that and said, you know, we don't have the we don't have the biomechanics to break these things down, so we can't we can't absorb these things, we can't digest these things. And he he said, well, no, that's ridiculous. Look at this study. It said that these this these bacteria in your gut, if you have the right bacteria in your gut, can break apart that bond. It's like okay, well, that's in your colon. And we absorb things in our small intestine. So unless you want to eat your feces and get that back through the through the ramp again, it doesn't matter that it got broken down in your colon by these bacteria if you have the bacteria, which you may or may not have. Um, so we the point is we don't we can't absorb it and then utilize those those uh, uh, nutrients once it's bound to phytic acid and, and forms these phytates. Uh, tannins are another group of uh, uh, defense chemicals that can bind to nutrients, cause nutrient deficiencies, bind to proteins and other, other sorts of, uh, nutrients that, um, that can, that can be, uh, harmful. There are a lot of different kinds of tannins and some tannins in very small amounts, very small amounts may have a, like a hormetic effect, um, because there are some studies that, that suggest that certain tannins may provide a benefit in very small amounts, but there are many different kinds of, of tannins. So it's just tannins in general, aren't uh aren't a good thing you need to know which tannins you need to know how much you're getting and it, that's very difficult you know just just guessing and saying ah, i bet it's fine you know you're just playing fast and loose with your health and yeah maybe maybe you guess the right dose but that's like you know just putting your hand in a pill jar uh you know with random medications in it saying well medicine's good for me and uh, well yeah too much medicine's bad but you know medicine's good for me so just take that out and just hope that that's you know, the right dose, you're not getting too much and it's the right medication. So it's not screwing you up. That's, that's, you know, obviously that's an extreme example, but I, I do think that that's similar to a similar response. You're, you're taking a guess and the, you know, the, the only person that has something to lose here is you. And so that's just not, that's just not a gamble that I, I'm really willing to make with myself. I do think that is an area. I'm glad we touched on that. I wanted to make sure we covered it. The hormetic stress, because that is such a big thing in the health and wellness space. The fact that, you know, people are cold plunging, they're fasting and doing things that are stressing the body or even exercise to have a positive benefit. So I could see pushback from people in the plant-based world saying, okay, fair enough. There's these plant toxins, but who's to say they're not putting good stress on the body? And you've touched on it a little bit, but can you elaborate on that more and how you think about that? Sure. Well, you know, when I when I first started talking about this, the, the pushback was, no, those the plants don't have chemicals in it. No, they don't. All that sort of stuff. And then they like Googled it and they're like, oh shit, okay, yeah, <laughs> all right. So, um, you know, this is just botany one hundred and one, biology one hundred and one. This is how plants defend themselves. All living things have a defense mechanism, and and plants are no different. Um, and uh, and so this is well documented and described. We have we have names and categorized these things going back literally thousands of years. We we just we know about this stuff very very uh, uh, in a robust manner. I mean, just because they don't teach it in nutrition class, because the nutrition sciences have been corrupted since its outset by the Seventh Day Adventist ter- Church, who are are uh, religiously anti anti meat they think it causes lustful feelings and therefore it's sinful because lust is a sin i swear to god this is the origins and they started the entire field of dietetics and and at the university level and so they've been 
in involved in, in nutritional research from the get-go and they've been pushing plants from the get-go. So at first, you know, when I was talking about this, you know, five, six years ago, people were just like incensed. They're like, no, you know, plants are wonderful. We're in the Garden of Eden. Everything's perfect. And like, okay, well, you know, why don't you just go to a park and just collect a bunch of leaves then? Why do you go to a grocery store? Why are you paying for just shrubbery? Why don't you just eat your yard waste and your and your lawn clippings? You know, just plant. If we're just meant to eat plants and just any plants and they're all good for you, why don't you do that? Uh, well, because they'll make you very sick and you can't get nutrients from them. Um, and so eventually they sort of came, maybe just like this year, I saw, I saw people then say, oh, well, actually it's, you know, yes, of course there are these things. And they've been denying them ever, you know, f- for years before that. And that. Yeah, yes, yes, there is this, these defense chemicals, but you know, you get this hormetic response and they're good for you. And it's like, hold on a second, which, which ones are hormetic and at what level, right? Because what hormesis is, is you're having something that's harmful to you, but in this little subset, this microdose, it, it may actually give a benefit but then past that, it's giving harm, okay? So you you actually do need – dose is important. And just like in medicine, you don't just take a random amount of Tylenol. You don't just take a random amount of digoxin, right? You'll kill yourself, right? And so, you know, you have that therapeutic window. You have that hormetic window. But less than that, you're not getting any, any good out of it. More than that, you're causing harm, okay? So it, dose really matters, okay? So what's the dose? Which chemical? Which chemical is hormetic? What's its benefit? What's this hormetic window? How do you know you're getting to enough or too much? This is why this is why we give pills to people instead of giving a, a tincture of leaves, right? You know, the naturopaths think that, well, yes, you know, a tincture of leaves is a very good idea. But the argument against that is like, well, say if you have heart failure, I would give you something that would that would help the contractility of your of your heart, like digoxin. There are a lot of people on digoxin for this reason. This is measured in micrograms. So you're giving, you know, 50, 100 micrograms. 50 millionths of a gram uh, to someone, and that hits that therapeutic window. Um, but they would say, okay, well, we'll give you foxglove, and that'll do the same thing, so, because that's where we derive digoxin digitalis from, right? And this is this is the plant's way of not trying to help people with heart disease. They were making these chemicals millions of years before we came around, millions and millions of years before we had heart, di- had, had, uh, heart failure, and they're going to be around millions of years after we're gone. And so this was to stop the heart and cause a, a fatal arrhythmia in animals and insects trying to eat it. That's, what's, that's what that's there for. But in micro, micro, micro doses, it increases the contractility of your heart and helps in heart failure. And a little bit more than that, 50 micrograms too much, it can stop your heart and kill you, right? So you need to know what that dose is. And so just giving somebody uh, you know, four ounces of leaves, well, you what were, what were the, the conditions? What were the soil conditions? Uh, was it, did you, uh, when was it picked? When was it dried? Did it need to be dried? Should it have been fresh? Did it need to be older? Did it need to be young? You know, all these sorts of things matter. And then also you're not just getting that chemical, you're getting the thousands of other chemicals that go along with it. So that's another thing about hormesis. Which chemicals are we talking about? What is the dose that's hormetic? And what about all the hundreds of other chemicals that are potentially damaging in that plant as well? Because you're getting one thing, okay, caffeine, okay, I get that effect. Well, what about the 150,000 other chemicals that are in coffee and tea? What do those do for you? And in what dose is it bad for you? You know, and so you have to describe that. If you're going to make that claim that there's a hormetic benefit from eating something that's that's known and cataloged as a toxin, and the, and we have the the clear effects biological biochemical that have been well classified, and you're saying no 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 no, but that's actually good for you. Okay, well then you have to show which chemical is good for you and at what level and at what dose, or else you're being extremely, uh, you're being, well, you're just being completely um, uh, inappropriate and uh, reckless with people's health. Um, the other thing is, is that you know, is this really a hormetic stress response? You know, exercise, cold plunges, that that gives a physiological response that can. That can benefit you in certain ways, but it, you know, you get too cold, you can die. Uh, exercise, you know, you can exercise too much, you can hurt yourself. But the point of, of the hormetic stress is you stress yourself, and then you give your body a chance to heal and adapt and repair, right? So you you work out, you work out hard, and you you sort of 
break down some muscles and it rebuilds stronger. But if you keep chronically breaking yourself down, breaking yourself down, breaking yourself down, then you actually don't give your chance, yourself a body, your body a chance to re regenerate. You will, you will actually cause harm. So, but with these chemicals, what, what's the hormetic benefit? You, know, is, you could argue that alcohol has a hormetic benefit or cocaine has a hormetic benefit because your body builds up a resistance to the alcohol and to the cocaine. So is that, is that a hormetic benefit or is that tolerance, right? You're just building up tolerance to this poison. Now, there's, there have been, uh, you know, different sorts of, you know, lords and diplomats and politicians historically going back hundreds of years, actually thousands of years. There was a guy in ancient Greece, I can't recall his name, but he was so paranoid of being poisoned and his food and things like that, that he was taking micro doses of hemlock and other sorts of, th of very commonly used poisons at the time uh, to just build up an immunity, build up a tolerance, right? And so you just slowly do this and you slowly build up a tolerance, build up a tolerance, build up a tolerance. And, you, you know, and, and so, you know, is that going to give him a benefit overall though? You know, like you drink alcohol all the time, you get your tolerance up. Oh, well, that's better because I have a tolerance to alcohol. That makes me stronger. Well, no, it makes you an alcoholic probably with cirrhosis, diabetes, and, you know, liver, liver cancer. So it, it will damage your body. Maybe you're getting this little bit of benefit in the context of drinking more alcohol. But overall, are you getting an overall hormetic benefit to your body? This gentleman uh, <laughs> back, in, back in ancient Greece, he actually did build up this tolerance to such an extent that it actually backfired because um, I think his kingdom got taken over and he was sort of hidden away somewhere and he was just like, okay, I need to off myself because I'm going to be just tortured and and uh, and uh, really, really hard done by if they catch me. And so he drank like a whole bunch of hemlock. He couldn't kill himself <laughs> with this, this poison because he had already, he built up such a tolerance to it that he actually couldn't, couldn't take himself out by poisoning himself. So he ended up getting captured. But, um, but that, that is, likely one of the only benefits of this is you build up a tolerance towards it. And I would argue that uh, tolerance towards alcohol doesn't actually give you an overarching benefit unless you're just, you know, going in a lot of drinking contests and that's how you make your money. But, you know, it's not good for your health overall. And so, you know, and that, and that but again, they're not describing any specific results. They're not saying, well, actually oxalates in this dose confer a benefit. Okay. And then after that, what do they do? Right. Or tannins or, you know, um, or, uh, you know, various lectins and things like that, you know, in a certain dose, maybe, I mean, arsenic and microdoses in some studies has, has shown some sort of benefit, right? But anything more than that is going to kill you, right? So you, you, it's important to know the dose and, and the response and things like that. And just saying that, uh, well, I bet you it's hormetic. Uh, is very irresponsible and it's it's playing very fast and loose with other people's health and that's not okay to do you know if you want to do that for yourself that's your business but if you start making recommendations to people saying that oh well you know what it's probably hormetic probably gives you a benefit you better damn well know what you're talking about because people can go out there and hurt themselves and uh, and they are and to add a whole nother layer of complexity to this as we're talking about you know the different components of plants and these plant toxins it gets me thinking about the fact that we're continuing to hybridize produce. So like the apple you find in the grocery store today, whether it be organic, conventional, all the different produce, or at least a good percentage of it, has been hybridized over the years and is probably very different than it was 10,000 years ago or even before that. So again, adding this layer of complexity, we've changed the composition and, and made these fruits a lot sweeter and more sugar content. So we're not even necessarily working with the original plants as they were meant to be initially. 100%. And that's, that's the thing, you know, none of these plants existed 50,000 years ago or hundred thousand years ago or 500,000 years ago when homo sapiens were evolving and not quite here yet. So you can't say that we evolved on something that were biologically adapted to something that didn't even exist when our biology when our biology was being formed, um, then some people will argue. And again, these are a lot of a lot of these statements are uh, are just statements. They're not actually supported by any evidence, so they don't 
They have no evidence either asked for or provided. They just say, well, I bet it's hormetic. And people just go, yeah, there's, it's hormetic. I'm like, okay, no, but you, you need evidence for that. You need to actually provide proof that that's what's going on. Uh, another assertion is that, well, through, through cultivation, we've actually made things less toxic. Um, well, that's a theory. But if you talk to farmers, they actually say, no, we want the ones that are more poisonous because then an insects and animals don't eat them, right? Because that's that gives you better crop yields. And this is where pesticides come in. You're spraying pesticides on a crop to make it even more poisonous so even less animals and insects can eat them so you can get a better yield or GMOs, right? The, what it, GMOs can do a lot of different things. It can give, you know, uh, uh, make it less sensitive to cold or to heat. Uh, but what they can also do is make it more poisonous. So let's say like, you know, locusts can eat plant A, but not plant B. You find out what is poisoning the locusts in plant B. You put that in, you splice that into plant A. Now locusts can't eat any of those things, right? And so that's, that's the idea behind GMOs. And that's why people are up in arms like, oh my God, you're, you're putting these, you're splicing these genes, you're making them more toxic. But yeah, that's the entire point. They're, they're trying to make them more toxic so in, insects can't eat them. So they get more of a crop yield. That's the idea. And so, um, you know, we're, we're not making these things less and less toxic because if they were less and less toxic, they, they're more and more vulnerable to animals and insects trying to eat them. And so that doesn't actually really help. Um, maybe some things, you know, but, uh, by and large, you know, you know, we're very happy keeping things just as toxic as they are, maybe even more toxic. We're, you know, with GMOs and other sorts of hybridization because it, it gets better crop yields. Um, so there, I mean, there, there are a number of things like, uh, cassava, cassava is, uh, the staple uh, root, and it's the number one calorie source for 500 million people in the tropics. It's the number three uh, most utilized, cal the, the most important calorie source in the tropics in general. And for 500 million people, they, they get the majority of their calories from cassava. Well, there's bitter cassava and there's sweet cassava. Sweet cassava, you know, is not fatal, but uh, can still have low-grade cyanide poisonings. Bitter cassava is very poisonous, it's very deadly. And so if you're in an area where you have a lot of animals coming in trying to eat your crops, they would plant the bitter cassava specifically so that they can, you know, av avoid uh, being eaten by by animals and things like that. So um, so that idea of, oh, we're getting things less and less poisonous, that's that's completely against the, the observed phenomenon. And you actually talk to people about this, they're doing the exact opposite. Um, and so... You know, it's, um, you know, if you don't process and treat the cassava, the bitter cassava properly, it can, it can actually kill you. There's so much cyanide in it, it can kill you. And, uh, but it doesn't, those pro that processing, uh, you know, thing that we do is not, uh, is not perfect. It doesn't get all the, the cyanide out of it. And so even low grade cyanide poisoning can actually cause thyroid dysfunction, neurological damage as well, especially, uh, it seems that. In, in people that are protein deficient, right? So if you're getting less than like sort of the international uh, recommendations for the minimum amount of protein, which most people are getting less than that, uh, you can you can actually get you know profound damage to your to your body and organs. Um, and you, we're talking about the tropics. We're talking about third world countries that that are impoverished in general, and and they're using cassava as their main calorie source out of necessity. You know, a lot of these people are going to fit that category where they don't have, they're not getting enough protein, they're not getting enough of other nutrients, and so they can, they can get affected in these ways. And you know, and some of these things, um, like oxalates in general, you know, it, it matters what your your biology and biochemistry are, and if you're metabolically fit and healthy in other ways, maybe this doesn't affect you as much, but other people it might affect more because you know you just have this long degradation of your metabolic system and your and your overall health and then you can get get more and more affected by this so and people that are more affected by this they're more malnourished uh, they're more protein deficient they have more chronic issues they are more susceptible to these things so these are the most vulnerable people they're the most vulnerable populations and these are the ones generally subsisting mainly and relying on plants for a majority of their their food source because it's cheap and accessible and so these are exactly the people that are at risk. And on the meat side of things, it gets me thinking about, you know, the domestication of pigs, cows, 
a lot of different animals where we're getting our meat, chickens, and we could go on and on. How have those animals changed over the years? Like how new to the genetic pool is a cow? If I picture back, you know, 100, 200,000 years, I'm picturing like buffalo roaming and and cows seem like these domesticated, um, you know, weak in comparison animals. And if we're basing, you mentioned 99% of your, your diet is based off of the cow and beef and steak. It's like, how do you think about that in comparison to wild animals? Well, you know, it's, it's mostly to do with what, what the animal is eating itself. You know, I mean, cow, cows are, are natural. They've been around for a very long time and they, and they were bred and domesticated from things like buffalo uh, or, um, you know, like, you know, you know, we have water buffalo and other sorts of things in different countries that have been domesticated uh, from the wild buffalo and then the aurochs, which is like a, just a, a big, massive cow, you know, uh, that's what the, the, you know, the current cows, uh, were domesticated from, um, you know, so they're not, they're not all that far off. And, you know, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about getting nutrients in the form of, of fat and protein. That's what we need. You, you know, the animal kingdom runs on fat and protein by and large. I mean, some insects and birds that, you know, drink nectar and have some differences in their biochemistry, but the, um, the vast majority of animals run on, um, on fat and protein. So, uh, even, you know, carnivores and herbivores, right? Carnivores, they eat animals with fat and protein. They eat the fat first. They go for that. That's the mainstay of their, of their diet is just trying to get fatty meat. Um, and, uh, but also herbivores because that's actually what they turn fiber into. So, so animals that eat fibrous food and are, are able to break that down, um, they don't actually absorb glucose. So, so fibrous string of glucose, right? So cellulose, um, but, um, geez, sorry. And, uh, but the, those are, those are bound up in ways that we can't access. So this is another way of the plant protecting itself. We cannot break those bonds. We can't get that glucose. We can't get that nutrient source. Um, so no vertebrate animal can break down cellulose, right? So it's the bacteria that's cultivated in the guts and the rumen of the cows say that, uh, that actually eat the fiber. And as a, as a byproduct, they actually produce short chain fatty acids, which are hundred percent saturated. So even gorillas that just eat green leaves, they get about 70% of their calories from saturated fat. Cows get closer to 80% of their calories from saturated fat. And then the bacteria die off and they're uh, broken down and absorbed as protein. So, you know, even animals that are just eating fiber are, are really, they're eating fiber, but they're absorbing fat and protein. So we need fat and protein just like all these other animals do. And we can't get that from fiber. That's another reason we know that we're not supposed to eat plants because we cannot derive any nutrition from fiber. We can't break it down. We used to, we used to be able to, you look at other primates, they have a, a long cecum, which we call an appendix it's about that big in, in a gorilla or a chimpanzee. It's like four or five feet long. And this is where fiber packs down into and breaks down into short chain fatty acids. We lost that ability millions of years ago because we haven't used it in millions of years. And, uh, and you know, there's high energy demand for, for the intestine. And so if you're not using that, you, you can't waste energy just having a big, long part of your gut that you're not using. That's you know, you're, you're going to die. You're going to waste energy and you're going to, to go extinct. So, you know, there's nothing, you know, that, uh, you know, even, even, you know, just, just bread cows and things like that. It's still, you know, protein and fat. And you're still getting these nutrients, still getting B12 and the, the niacin and all the different sorts of things that you need in the proportion that you need it. But specifically if they're eating what they're supposed to eat. So the difference between domesticated animals and wild animals is generally the wild animals are eating what they're designed to eat. And they're going to have all the nutrients that they need and they're going to be as healthy as they can be. So it's generally more nutrient dense and packed with, uh, with, with, you know, more that, you know, we would use uh, for ourselves. It's very bioavailable. Um, domesticated animals, if they're fed what they're supposed to eat, they're going to be, you know, right on par with those with those wild animals, as long as the soil health is 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 such that it provides those nutrients to the animal. And that that's a whole other thing, um, you know, that um, that people are now getting into now, which is regenerative agriculture, whereas you're you're sort of pasturing cows and sort of keeping them moving like you know in, in the wild if there were predators you know herd of buffalo herd of cows would be you know tight packed in 
And because they're protecting themselves, you don't want to have a bunch of stragglers where, you know, a pack of wolves or a lion can get you. So you, you tight packed in and that, that keeps everything bunched and moving. Now everything's urinating and defecating on the things that you're eating. So you have to just keep moving and keep moving. You're sort of eating patches here and you're leaving your, your, uh, you know, you're, you're leaving your leavings and you have to just keep moving, keep moving. And this, this keeps things moving and migrating and not overgrazing and damaging and also leaving a lot of nutrients for, for uh, the the soil, which is like the urine and, and feces, which is fertilizer. And so regenerative agriculture, they'll move these animals around pastures, um, and it, simulating that sort of migration pattern. And uh, and it gets much more healthy. And then they'll, they'll move uh, chickens in. They'll have the bugs going after all the, the droppings and things like that. The chickens are eating the bugs that are going for the droppings. And now you're upcycling those nutrients as well. And, uh, and, and the pattern goes on and this actually makes the grass grow better, grows longer, grows faster if you do it this way. And it makes the nutrients in the soil more rich, uh, which makes the grass more nutrient dense, which makes the cows more nutrient dense. And every generation that you do this, the soil is getting better, the grass is getting better, the cows are getting better. And so you'll see the nutrient content in these regenerative raised animals be, you know, triple, quadruple that of, you know, normal feedlot beef, right? So that makes a big difference. It was a, I saw a uh, talk given by a gentleman who did regenerative agriculture. I think he was, he was talking at Hillsdale College and he said that his, that like a normal chicken egg, you know, if I, if I'm not, I apologize if I'm, I'm uh, misremembering the exact, um, the exact quote, but I think he was talking about uh, folate and the amount of folate that was in a, a normal chicken egg, um, an yeah, average chicken egg in America was about uh, 41 milligrams. But in his eggs, from his chickens, it was over a 1,000, right? So it was a massive, massive, massive uh, bonus in, in the amount of nutrients that are there. And I've, I've sort of experienced that. You know, I got a, an older cow. I got I went directly to the rancher, which I think is the best way to do it. You're cutting out the middleman. It's better for the rancher. It's better for you. You know how that animal is raised. You know it was ethically raised, ethically cared for. I get older cows. A, it has a longer, nicer life. And also it tastes a lot better. And I think that's because of this nutrient density. It has just a much more intense, beefy flavor, which I like. And so I got a 10-year-old cow that was only eating grass its entire life and never ate anything else. And this thing was amazing. I felt supercharged every time I ate it. I, I had to eat much less. Your, our bodies are chasing nutrients more than they're chasing calories. And so I was eating this and I ate half of what I would normally eat from the store. And I just, I was just buzzing and teeming with energy. I, I just felt amazing. And so, yeah, I do think there's a difference there, but I think it's more to do with what the animal is eating and being fed rather than their genetics. Well, it's interesting as you talk about that, it gets me thinking about how when we think of the quality of the animal, it's a microcosm for what we've been talking about in this conversation, where when we buy better quality, we're trying to avoid toxins, things like antibiotics or different, you know, different stuff that's in the feed that they're giving a conventional animal. And you mentioned the increased nutrition. So it's that same that same yin and yang that we've been talking about comes down to when we're buying better quality animals. So given all that, you mentioned this 10 year old cow, how much of a priority is that for you when you're buying your animals? Is that a regular thing for you to buy organic, grass fed, grass finished? How do you look at that and how do you allocate your money for different qualities? Well, in, in America, I certainly did that. And that's um, because I had access to it. And um, you, and you definitely have access to it in Canada and, and America. In Australia, you, you don't really. It's it's harder to do that. Your The systems are in place are such that you really have to go through the the big uh, you know manufacturers and the abattoirs and things like that. You can't go direct to the farmer, unfortunately. Um, there are some things like uh, butcher crowd, um, which has, um, I've recently been in contact with and ordered some of their, their boxes and that, that comes straight from the farmer. And so you can get, you can get that experience there. Uh, but even then, I mean, I, I'm not able to source a, like, a like I want the oldest cow that you have in your lot sort of thing. It's just, it's the normal steers, but it, it is, you know, raised on just pasture raised sort of, uh, thing. So you can do that. There are those options, but, you know, in America, I could just, I could just call a rancher and just say, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. I just, I want an older cow. You know, you, are you calling any, um, you know, coming up? And I'm like, well, actually, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to, 
we're, we're planning to call a 10 year old cow from the herd, you know, uh, later, you know, in three months or so, um, you know, you can have that. Normally they just grind them down for hamburger because, you know, there's not really a market for older beef because people think it's more tough and it's not as, as, um, as tender, which is, I didn't find that to be the case at all. Uh, but you're, you're really, but even if it is, if it were, it's not enough of a difference to, to be a bother to me. And also you're sacrificing flavor and nutrient profile for, for tenderness, which I don't think is a, is a good trade off. Um, and so I just went to them and I got that. It was cheaper. It was cheaper per pound than, than I could have gotten a, you know, a two year old steer from the same guy, right? Because it was, it was less in demand and it was better for him because he got less, much less money for these things than, um, than he would otherwise. And so, you know, he got more and I got more, you know? And so, uh, that was, a, that was a win-win. Unfortunately here in Australia, I don't really have the same access. Um, I think there are some people that, you know, if you know a farmer or you have your own cow or something like that, then you can slaughter it for your own use or something like that, or, or, or work an arrangement. If you, if you know somebody, I don't, I don't, unfortunately don't have those connections yet. And so, uh, I haven't been able to do that, but but uh, so I I still just buy store bought, you know Safeway beef, Costco beef. I generally go to Costco. I get I buy in bulk, and you know it, it works great. You know it's it's not as good I don't think. But there are, there have been some studies sort of looking at the difference. You you, know, you don't see sort of big macro differences where someone's actually getting deficient and problems having problems just from eating store bought beef. I felt better with the grass fed, grass finished, older cow. Definitely, I enjoyed that more. But uh, I don't. I don't think you're going to do yourself any harm, and, and that's one of the things too that you don't have to do just the grass-fed, grass-finished, organic, all that sort of stuff. You know, just Safeway meat is excellent. You know, I think of it as the the difference between gold, silver and gold medalists at the Olympics, right? So the silver medalist lost to gold, but the silver medalist also beat everyone else on Earth, right? So if you can't get gold, then Look, silver, like you're not losing by going silver. So um, I still eat, the majority of what I eat is just just store-bought, you know, feedlot beef. And I feel great as a result of that. It's better than any of the other alternatives apart from grass-finished and fed and finished uh, meat or, or you know, wild-caught game would be, would be ideal, of course. But um, I don't have access to that either, unfortunately. And how do you feel about prepping the meat? As somebody who is consuming only meat, to me, that would be a big concern. You know, if you're out barbecuing every day and charring your meat versus, you know, putting it in the oven and baking a steak. Um, yeah, I'm not somebody that cooks a ton of meat, so I don't have like a full array of different ways of cooking it. But how do you think about that from a health perspective? Oh, well, I mean, I mean, just just your skills in cooking are going to increase dramatically when the only thing you cook is, is meat, you're going to get pretty damn good at cooking meat. So like, you know, I, I, you know, my steaks, you know, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say that, uh, you know, I, I've, the steaks I make are better than any steakhouse I've ever been to. I've no problem saying that. Um, and, um, but that's how I prepare it. You know, I, I age, I, I have my fridge is only meat, right? So it's 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 a dedicated meat fridge. I can I can age these things. I have them aging. I have them wet aging. I have them dry aging. I have individual steaks uh, cut up and lightly salted on drying racks. As uh, I learned from um, watching an Alton Brown video, he was a, he was a chef, a celebrity chef sort of guy. And you just salt it, put it on drying rack so it's not touching anything, so air can circulate around all of it, and it sort of dries it out a bit, and the salt gets into it, and it just makes the browning so much better. It has this crispy, crunchy crust. It almost, you know, if you age it long enough, it almost tastes like chocolate. It's just this deep, rich, lovely taste. And so, you know, and then I, I, you know, I know exactly how to cook it, exactly how long to get exactly the, the you know, you know, rare to medium rare that I want, and uh, with a nice, you know, crispy crust on the outside. And so I, I'm happy to cook uh, on my, I, I, you know, I, I much prefer cooking. Uh, that's another thing too. You save a lot of money not going out to eat, not going out to restaurants all the time because I, you know, my, you know, the food I cook is better. And, you know, I have people come over uh, for dinner sometimes and they're just like, oh my God, you eat this every night? And I was like, yeah, I do. It's like, well, no wonder you don't go out. I would never leave the house if, you know, if I was eating this every day. You know, and so it makes a big difference. So as far as concerns about cooking and you know, charring it and things like that, not too concerned. The studies that looked at the um, you know, potential harmful effects of charring meat 
uh, you know, were done in, in lab animals with thousands of times the amount of, you know, of these chemicals that then you would find in, in like a, a burnt steak, right? So it's not, it's not, we're not comparing apples to apples, right? So you're looking at something in a much higher proportion. So it's, um, you know, we've been cooking meat. There's been, there's very good archaeological evidence um, that, that we've been cooking meat f- and possibly in ovens for at least 790,000 years, right? So half a million years before Homo sapiens existed, we were cooking meat. And some people think it's actually much longer than that, probably like a million and a half years we've been cooking meat. So we've been cooking meat for a very long time. We uh, Whatever is in cooked meat and burnt meat is something we are well adapted to at this point. You know, it's not like the, the agricultural revolution where it's only about 8,000 years ago that we had, we've been, um, faced with this stuff uh it was it's this is half a million years before we even showed up and so we evolved on uh cooked meat and potentially charred meat so on open fire you know i mean and uh, i'm sure they got very good at it too but i'm sure there was some burnt charred bits on there as well a typical steak though would you sear it inside like on a pan and then put it in the oven or are you a fan of using the barbecue i'm sure there's a lot of okay, different so- variety in the way you're cooking because again you're I'm yeah. guessing trying to make it taste different day to day, but what is the typical cooking of a steak look like? Well, I usually do things pretty consistently because I found something that that works and gets gets the results that that I really like. So you know, I'm not worried about like switching things up and like oh, I want something different because you know most people get tired of what they're eating if they're eating the same thing because it's nutrient deficient and your body gets used to those nutrients and says, okay, no, we got enough of those. We need this other thing now. And so those other things taste better. Whereas a steak is complete nutrition. So it has everything you need in the proportion that you need it. So as long as you're hungry, it's always going to taste good. And so I, I even catch myself doing this now where I, where I get like, um, well, I'll, I'll cook a steak and I'm, you know, I'm hungry and it's been a long day and I, I cut into it in the first bite. I'm like, I know I will you know, audibly say like, man, that's good. And I'll say every time, you know? And so I didn't even catch myself. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I've been doing this for six years, you know? Like, but it is every single time. It's like, my God, that's good. Because that, that first hit, my body really wants those nutrients. I've cooked it in a very good way. So it's just like, this is amazing. And uh, and so I always, I'm always happy to eat the same thing all the time because that's, that's what my body wants. And Normally, uh, if it's just like a, you know, like a just a normal steak, like boneless steak, I'll cook that in the pan. I'll, I'll use actually probably about a centimeter of of uh, fat, so like tallow um, and uh, or duck fat or whatever. And uh, usually, it's just the drippings from the previous steaks, and and it's almost sort of partially deep frying this stuff, and it'll get that crispy, crunchy. Uh, exterior like you would if you were you know frying this sort of thing deep frying this thing and so I get all I mean because I, I make like big thick like three inch thick steaks and so I'll you know uh, brown and crisp all the edges as well and then I get each side and be all brown and crispy and um, usually I just do it on the pan I don't then finish it off in the oven um, I like things less cooked in general but you know like like a rare medium rare you know like rare to medium rare more like seared and Pretty much raw in the middle. I like um, one thing. I will do is I'll take a steak out in the morning and I'll just leave it on the counter to to come up. You know, if you do this like an hour, twenty minutes, or whatever before, you know, there's no point. You know, it's not gonna it's not gonna warm up in time. It takes hours and hours and hours to warm up to to room temperature. But if you do have the time and you you set that out in the morning, you're able to let it sit for ten hours. It will come up to room temperature, and then you can just have. It just cooks differently, you know, whereas if you, if you come up with a big three inch thick steak, you put that on the pan, it'll be all crunchy and brown on the outside and it will be cold still in the middle. Uh, and so that's something you would probably want to finish up in the oven. Uh, but I'm generally too lazy. I just want to eat it. And so I don't do that. I just eat it more raw in the middle. Um, but if you let it, if you let it come to room temperature, uh, then it, it will start cooking that in the middle as well. And so it's just, you know, four minutes for a big thick steak. I might do, you know, three minutes or four minutes on each side, possibly five minutes on each side. And uh, and that usually gets a, a good rare to medium rare with really nice crust on the outside. And if it's a big tomahawk with a big bone, that doesn't, that's not going to fit in a pan. So I'll, I'll do that on the grill. So you mentioned something there that really caught my attention. The fact that a steak is a complete meal, complete nutrition. 
and we know 99% of the time you're having steak as, as your solo meat of the day, do you feel like that other 1% is essential for getting a diversity of nutrients? It doesn't sound like it, but I really want to hammer home this point. So if you were told for the rest of your life, you could only eat that steak, it sounds like you feel like you'd be getting complete nutrition, having that exact same meal every day. Yeah, hundred oh, percent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no steak. Steak is is everything, you know. So, you know, I think that even you know even having a bit of eggs or chicken or pork or something like that that I have is probably less good than the steak, and and probably knocking me back a bit. And that's and that's usually why it's ninety nine percent of what I eat is steak because I, you know maybe I'll have some some you know pork bellies or eggs or, or, you know, if I, I can only really get bacon and eggs at the hospital, if I'm, if I wanted to eat during the day. And so I'll get like 10 eggs and like six big long strips of bacon, like full strips, like down here they do. I mean, it's like a foot long or more of, of, of bacon. And so that's, um, you know, I'll do that for, for a few days. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good, but I'm not feeling my best. And so I just really focus on just eating beef. And after sort of five days of just beef, I'm like, yeah, okay, this is, this is how I'm supposed to feel. So yeah, no, I think, I think it's, um, it's that 1% that's actually dropping me back a bit as opposed to the 99% of beef. So yeah, if I, if I could just eat beef my whole life, I absolutely would. Um, you know, if I, if I just had a, some land out and some cows and, you know, maybe some sheep, but I don't know if I'd even want them. Uh, but, uh, maybe some goats and, uh, goats are fun. And, uh, and then just like wild game and, and just, you know, fresh beef. I think that would be, that would be it for me. I'd be happy. Some more nuance on that steak. You mentioned a number of times fatty meat. So are there certain steaks that you would totally avoid? And when it comes to eating steak, a lot of them have like that, you know, fat around the side. Do you cut any of that away? It doesn't sound like it, but I'm just curious. And then the salt piece, is that for flavor? Is that for getting some minerals? I assume for flavor, but again, elaborate on all that. Uh, yeah, so I never, I never trim the fat. I always want all the fat, and I, I usually in Australia it's very difficult because because it has to go through the abattoir. You can't, you don't have as much of a of a input on it. You know, you can't talk to the butcher say, hey, can you not trim all this stuff on it? Because most of the time they're not trimming any any of it off. It's it's just coming to them already trimmed, and so yeah, you know, sometimes they will, but you know, but you can, and so sometimes you can just say, hey, don't trim trim anything off. Um, so yeah, I know I never, I never trim anything off. I mean, when I, when I sort of was getting into this, um, I understood that fat wasn't bad for me and, and cholesterol would have been, uh, you know, used as a scapegoat for really for sugar and other processed garbage. Um, but it was so ingrained in me that, you know, since I was a kid, it was just like fat's bad, fat's bad, fat's bad. So even though I understood and I'd seen the research and the studies and, and all these sorts of things and historical documentation about the fraud perpetrated on you know, vilifying cholesterol and fat when it was more likely sugar, um, I was still trimming the fat off. And I caught myself once. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, you know, I, I trust the research. I believe the data. You know, the fat's good for me. Eat the damn fat. And so I had to, I had to like, tell myself that but it was still like it was this this physical repulsion of, of just eating fat because my whole life was just like that's bad that's bad that's bad and so i associated this texture and flavor with something that was bad for me so i had to i just sort of you know recondition myself and I, so i cut off a sliver of fat because i couldn't just eat the fat i cut off a piece of it and put it with a more lean piece of meat eat those together and I'm like okay well that tastes good together in that combination like a marbled steak would taste good and and I started doing that a little more, a little more. Then I could have a little more fat with the meat, and a little more fat. And now I just, I just eat butter, and I mean, it's it's delicious. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I I do go for the fattier cuts of meat. I generally look at, at something, and I and I go for the fat content. I want more fat on the on the meat, um, and so I, I just I just go gravitate towards those cuts. And they're generally the cheaper cuts anyway, except for, for ribeye. That's obviously. Um, uh, a more designer cut, but you know, like chuck, brisket, those are very cheap. And usually, ground beef, it, if it's a fattier content, it's cheaper, you know. And so that works for me. Um, for the salt, yeah, that's purely flavor profile for me. Uh, I don't think you need it. There, I mean, there's plenty of people that don't. There's uh, thoughts that we only started really using salt, uh, you know, mineral mined mineral salt and sea salt. Um, after the agricultural revolution, we started eating things, uh, you know, not 
in keeping with our biology, and then we needed to to change things up a, a bit and maybe add in some mineral salts. But there are a number of different you know carnivores that don't use salt and don't salt their meat, and they 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 actually think it's it's better to not do that. They feel better without it. Uh, I I've not eaten salt uh, you know for a month at a time before. And, uh, and I felt fine and there was no issues. I wasn't getting cramps. I wasn't getting any neurological issues, which is what you get with, with, uh, low sodium. And, um, you know, there, there wasn't, there wasn't an issue. So I do it just because of that, that, uh, drying technique that I use where I, I take the steak and I'll put some salt on it and then it'll just sort of help dry it out. So I find that that just helps the drying process a bit. And, uh, and it sort of gets a bitter sort of crust. And so I've done that, uh, for that reason, but you can, you can certainly do it without that. You can, you can put it on the drying racks and just let it dry out on its own. You don't have to put salt on it, but I, as I go, I'm using less and less and less salt, um, as I go anyway. So, uh, it's just been a natural sort of progression to use less and less salt, but no, I don't think you need it. I don't think you have to have it. Uh, I think you get everything you need just from the meat. And I've, I've practiced that myself and done that myself. And I know a number of people have been doing carnivore diet uh, consistently far longer than I have, 20, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, not using any any sort of salt. And, um, you know, so I don't think you have to. That's just purely, purely for, you know, flavor preference for me. Got it. Earlier on in the conversation, you mentioned the ketogenic diet or being in ketosis and I think you refer to the carnivore diet, something like being the ultimate ketogenic diet. Do you feel like because of the amount of protein you're having and say you're eating different cuts of meat and, and a different variety of meat, do you feel like you ever get out of ketosis or you're in 24 seven? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't, I don't think so. But then again, I've, I've never checked. I've never checked my ketones. Uh, because I don't care. You know, I, I, I do this, uh, on first principles, you know, this is what we're designed to eat this is what is biologically appropriate for us to eat. And so I'm just going to eat it and, uh, and trust that my body knows what to do with it at that point. So if I'm in ketosis or not in ketosis, that's something that my body is going to, going to be in or not, uh, because it's supposed to be in it or not. And, uh, and I don't really worry about that. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to micromanage my biochemistry because like, you're not, you're not going to win that battle right? Our, our bodies are insanely complex and these interactions are insanely complex. And so the, the best way of managing or micromanaging your body's physiology and biochemistry is just to give it what it needs and stay out of its way. Right. And so, so that's what I do. Um, I would imagine that I'm in ketosis most of the time. I might slip in and out every now and then, but uh, I'm not too worried about it, uh, one way or the other, really. Um, just as long as you're eating what you're supposed to eat. But yeah, it is. You know, you're you're not eating any carbohydrates. You're not eating any sweeteners or anything like that. And uh, and you know, while you know, I I fully agree with you know the keto crowd that you know this is this is a good idea to cut out carbs, cut out sugar, cut out alcohol. Those are all very good benefits to our health, um, biochemically as well as many other reasons. That but there there are more than they're more than just carbohydrates and alcohol that can cause harm. And so, you know, it, this is the ultimate keto diet because you're, you're not eating, you're not even eating, well, well, 50 grams is okay. 20, no, no, no grams is okay. You don't want to eat any of that crap. And you also don't want to eat any of the other things too, that can also cause harm. So this is a, this is a, a complete elimination diet. You're eliminating out everything that you don't need, everything that's just on the side and that could be causing harm, whether it causes appreciable harm to you or not, there's a potential there. And you're definitely getting rid of everything. And so some people are going to be more sensitive or less sensitive. So maybe, you know, you start with that. You start just eating steak. You do that for a couple of months and you say like, how do I do with green beans? I used to like green beans with butter. You know, I'll try that and be like, hmm, actually that's giving me asthma and my face is getting itchy. And like, oh, that's, that's really weird. I didn't know that. Um, or it might be like, hmm, I don't really notice too much of a difference. Fine. You know, if you want to do that and you want to include that in your life, you can go for it. But um, it is the complete elimination diet because it gets rid of everything you don't need that could be causing harm and more or less harm to different people. And so you at least gives you a strong baseline with which to then build upon if you want to. I don't particularly want to. I don't particularly care. I don't need any of those things. And so, you know, even if they don't, you know, cause a, a great amount of harm to me, I don't need them. I don't want them. And so, you know, I don't, I don't use them, you know? And so 
uh, you know, but sometimes like some little spices or, or things like that will mix in and I'll, I will actually notice it in 20, 30 minutes. Like, again, my face will get itchy. My nose will get runny. I'll have uh, a, um, you know, a bit of a, a tickle, like tightening in my chest, like, you know, asthma or, or maybe something gets in and, you know, I get muscle aches and joint pains and my back hurts for a few days. And it's like, what the hell is that about? And it's like, oh, okay, well that, you know, I, I had some salami and I had some other things and had some things mixed in it and sort of did that three days in a row. And like, okay, now it's, now it's sort of building up. So, you know, I do notice these things. It's much more subtle. I mean, I feel a thousand times better than I ever felt in my entire life, which is why I can now feel those subtle changes. Whereas if we're just eating, you know, nonsense all every day, those subtle changes, they're, they're just background noise. You're not going to, you're not going to see it. You're not going to notice it. But because I'm just way up here all the time, I'm not just this, you know, middling, you know, sort of always feeling crappy and just maybe up and down from that level of baseline level of garbage that I feel. I feel amazing all the time. You know, just a little detraction from that is, you know, still 900 times better than I ever felt throughout the course of my life, but it's worse than I feel now. So I was like, I'm not interested. Well, the interesting thing I think of as you say that is it's obvious how sensitive you've become eating, you know, such a narrow range of foods. Have you ever thought about the fact maybe 20, 30 years down the road, you've been doing this diet and you become super sensitive and then there's a little bit of parsley and some meat you're eating or something and it throws you off for a week. Like, are you, and this ties back to our hormesis that we were talking about before, the fact that you would never want to, I, I guess, you know, some people could argue putting some plant toxins in their body could be a good thing so they don't weaken themselves over time and become super sensitive. But is that something that ever crosses your mind or you worry about? So are you, are you worried about not doing heroin? Because in the future, if you get exposed to heroin, you might overdose on heroin? No, but so heroin you, you isn't, up- heroin isn't in my face 24 seven. If you're at a restaurant yeah. and you know what I mean? Well, like this stuff is everywhere. This is the world we live in. But, but it's the same, it's the same principle. It's the same principle, right? So it, it's, it goes back to hormesis, but, but really the difference between hormesis and tolerance, right? Because, you know, I would have built up a tolerance to all these things. But do I want that tolerance? Do, does that does that benefit me more than the benefits I get from just not eating it at all? I don't. I don't think so. So I'm 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 probably as intolerant to those things now as I'm ever going to get. I don't think that 30 years from now I'm going to be any worse. It's just like you know I haven't drank in two years either, you know. And and so you know in, in five years am I going to get you know uh, is that going to hit me more than it would just now? It'd probably be about the same. Probably my tolerance for alcohol has gone away completely. And, uh, and I just have whatever my innate sort of ability to break that stuff down and tolerate it is. I think that's probably the same for parsley as well. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, people do get more sensitive to these things. I think that's a combination of things. I think that's losing that tolerance, certainly. But also, I think now you recognizing what this is doing to you because you can see that contrast. Whereas before, when you're eating a lot of different plants, a lot of plants and a lot of different plants, and a lot of sugars and processed garbage and coffee and tea and stimulants and all these sorts of things. You, you, you just you're throwing in a, a lot of chemicals in your body. You have this massive chemical experiment in your body, um, and uh, and so you know you don't you, you don't really see all the, the subtle differences where you add in some arugula and that sort of makes something different. But in the background of all this you know, this tsunami of things that you're doing to your body, I mean, you're not going to notice it. So right now you can, you you, you can be more, um, it's more apparent, right? Because you don't have anything wrong in the system. You've got a Swiss watch. It's working, working great. You drop one piece of sand in there. All of a sudden things start sparking and cracking and doing weird things. If you dump, you know, a whole handful of salt in that, it's just going to stop, you know, so adding in a couple more grains, well, what does that do? You know, so now you have you have a clean, clean running watch and you throw in a couple of grains of sand. Yes, you are going to see a difference and it's going to have it's going to have more of an effect on you now than it will if you have all this stuff in you and that tolerance. So I think it's both. I think you're you're going to notice it more and you're yes, you will be more tolerant, you will be more intolerant to it. And I think that combination makes it a much more noticeable effect. But I think that for me, you know, that's worth it down the road. You know, if I'm starving and I'm out somewhere and I, and I have to eat carrots or an apple or something like that, I can survive on that. You know, it's not going to kill me, but you know, I might feel a bit crummy for a while, but if I have to subsist on that for a while, 
my body will build a tolerance to it and will be able to handle those toxins a bit better and a bit better. And I'll be able to go back to my old style of eating, which is, you know, eating meat, but also uh, supplementing that with, uh, you know, carbs and vegetables and things like that. And if I have to do that because I just don't have the access to meat and I, I can't survive, well, then you have to, you know, I think that is a huge survival advantage. I think that's probably one of the, uh, there's one of the reasons why humans uh, have been so successful in different areas and all over the globe is because in times of famine and stress, we have been able to survive, uh, you know, since the megafauna died out, since the mastodons and, and woolly mammoths and things like that, since they died off, you know, we've had to, we've had to go to different, different means of, of, of food and not all areas have had, you know, hundred million wild buffalo just roaming around, you know, for them to, to go after. And so they've had to go to other means. And I think that that's definitely a survival advantage. Uh, but I don't think that that, that means that that's optimal for us to do all the time outside of that survival state. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. I think I'm probably as intolerant to it as I'm ever going to get. And unless I'm, you know, starving to death, I, I, I don't plan on, interacting with plants much anyway, apart from, you know, just visiting them occasionally on walks. And, um, you know, so I don't, I don't think it's uh, too big of an issue for me. We opened up talking about the biggest carnivore uh, mistakes people are making. And you gave a couple there and I jumped in to get some more nuance on one of them. And, and I interrupted your thought process there. So I want to make sure you have time to to fully unravel if you had any other things you wanted to add there. Yeah, the different, different Carnivore mistakes. I think that's. I think that's uh, much of them is you know is is just eating is eating other things or just eating a lot more meat, but also eating other things. Some people will say, well, you know, I it helped a lot of health issues. I felt a lot better, but I didn't lose as much weight as I wanted to. So I guess it didn't work for me. And I always ask them, okay, what exactly were you eating? What exactly were you doing? Or maybe they're having other problems as well. Or maybe the problem is that they're feeling better, but they're not feeling as good as they thought they would, or not having as great of a benefit as they thought they would. And uh, you know, sort of talk to them quite often they are still including other things and uh, especially like artificial sweeteners and sort of junk that I would I wouldn't recommend anyone put in their body um, and then you know not eating enough and not eating enough fat in particular fat is is very important you know it's not a it's not just a calorie source calories are a bit of a weird concept anyway because we're talking about the heat energy that comes off after burning them as opposed to the chemical interactions these very complex organic molecules have in our body. Um, you know, you, you can't just interchange, you know, you know, three ounces of glycine with, you know, one ounce of, of, uh, of steric acid and, and think that you're coming out equal. I mean, these are different chemicals that have different properties and, and responses in your body. So, uh, it's, it's very important to get enough fat. Most people don't eat enough fat because we're afraid of fat and we're like, Oh, fat's bad for me. The fat's good for you. you should eat the damn fat. And, uh, I go, I think a, a good way of testing that is, uh, by our stools. Uh, our body has a limited capacity for absorbing fat, uh, from our bile. We make bile from our liver that's stored in our gallbladder that's released when we eat a big fatty meal. But we generally, most people, according to the books, textbooks, um, we create about 800 milliliters to a liter of bile a day. And whatever the amount that we make, there is a limit to the amount that we make. And so you really have a hard time absorbing fat without bile. It's very, very like small percentage of the fat that you eat without bile will get absorbed. And so once you run out of bile, most of that excess will go out in, in waste. And so it's really, it's really hard to overeat fat because you just have a physiological cap on the amount that you can absorb. And so I just go for big air. I try to get a lot of fat. And then I see, you know, if, if there's fat coming out, that'll keep your stool soft. So people think, well, I, how am I going to get, uh, how am I going to, you know, go to the bathroom? I, I'm not eating fiber. Well, 66% of all animal species are carnivores. They don't eat any fiber and, you know, they go just fine. It's actually fat that drives the digestion. And so if you're getting enough fat, you'll have enough for your body to absorb as much as it wants to, because I think that's your body's making an amount of bile because it wants a certain amount of fat in return. Uh, I don't think your, your body just doesn't make things, it doesn't make a random amount of bile because it wants a random amount of fat. This is a very controlled uh, uh, nutrient that it wants to get in. And so you get enough for your body and then there's a bit extra 
that sort of spills over and that keeps your stool soft. So you know you're getting enough fat if your stools are still soft because there's a bit of excess fat and your body's absorbed all it wants to and then there's a little bit extra. Uh, if you're getting really dry, hard stools, some people say like, oh, I'm getting constipated. Um, and uh, that that that's why generally people aren't eating enough fat. Uh, but some people get mixed up with constipation uh, and frequency of, of bowel motions. Even if you go once a week or once every two weeks, that's not necessarily constipation. Uh, that's just frequency. You're absorbing 98% of the meat that you're eating. There's, there's garbage that people say like, oh, it takes 10 years to, to break down meat. Like it's not in your body for 10 years. You know, it's this is like if it's in your body for two days, it's now out of your body in your feces, right? So that doesn't make any sense. You can't absorb uh, fiber at all. And that's what they said. Oh, this is good that you can't break it down and digest it because it gives you something to peristalsis and move through. Okay, well then why isn't a steak doing that? If you can't break down a steak, wouldn't that be doing the same thing as fiber? Wouldn't that be good for, as fiber for the same reasons? And, you know, they don't have an answer for that generally um, because I haven't thought about it. But no, you absorb 98% of the meat that you eat because you're biologically uh, designed to eat meat and you get almost everything from meat that that you can't that uh, is available and then a little bit extra comes out so you're going to have much less waste right and that's it's in the name it's waste it's wasteful you didn't need to eat it it goes out right and so you may go once or twice a week but as long as it's that soft normal consistency then that then that's fine if you're eating a lot more fat than your body wants, then you're just going to have loose stools. And this can cause uh, people to have diarrhea. You know, Joe Rogan called it disaster pants for the first two weeks. You know? And um, uh, and that can be just because you're, you're, you're eating a lot more fat than your body can absorb. And sometimes your body will then see like, oh, hey, we're getting enough, we're getting more and more fat. Hey, let's, let's, let's get more of this. It starts increasing the amount of bile that you make. Uh, and then you can absorb more fat. Uh, another reason why people uh, get disaster pants early on is, uh, is because they're, they're still drinking coffee. Most people drink coffee in general. And then if you do that on carnivore, you don't have all these big blockages of, of fiber and which is just wood cellulose, right? Um, in your intestines that are just slowing things down. So it increases motility, but it's still trying to move a lot of, of matter through and it, and it's just going slower. So when you, take that out and you don't have all these blockages, you drink the same amount of coffee and this just goes right through you. And so, and that can actually hide constipation. So someone says, oh yeah, I drink coffee every day, but yeah, my stools are, are normal. They're nice and soft. Okay. You're probably horribly constipated. It's just that you're, you're masking that with the laxative effects of coffee and uh, artificial sweeteners as well. Most artificial sweeteners act as laxatives as well. So most people are still using artificial sweeteners, usually in the coffee, and then they they have that problem. So that's another that's another thing uh, that that I think is good to watch out for. You want to get enough fat. You want to get the right the, the right amount of fat, and that's a good way of testing it. While you talk about coffee, it gets me thinking about somebody who say makes a lot of the switches we're talking about today, and they're eating basically an all meat diet. But say they're having coffee, tea, and maybe some sauces on their meat that you know have some plants in them. It gets me thinking about all the different chronic diseases we talked about before that can be healed or greatly reduced with a diet like this. How hardcore does somebody have to be basically to get these benefits and to heal? If they're still having coffee, tea, and some sauces on their meat, are they still going to have miraculous healing benefits or do they have to go all the way? Well, you're going to get a lot of benefit from this because you're going to be removing a lot of the causative agents that are that are um, making you sick. And you're also going to be getting a lot more of the beneficial nutrients that are going to keep you well. So you're going to get a lot out of that. But I do think that you you get the most benefit from really just getting rid of everything, just like that watch gear analogy where you know if you don't have any sand in the gears, even a couple grains of sand are going to cause a, a, a noticeable problem, right? But then when you dump a whole bunch of sand in there, you know, a few extra grains, it's not going to make as big of an impact as those first few grains, right? So, uh, and I, you know, I've noticed that just in myself, just getting rid of just the last vestiges of all plants. I just, it just changed dramatically my health and in my my patients and clients that I've worked with, uh, and even just 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 friends and family and people that I've just helped out over the years, you know, getting rid of just the last bits of these things seems to have a very, very big and lasting effect. 
Um, however, you will get a lot of benefit just eating a lot more meat, really not being afraid of the fat, eating a lot more fat, and just cutting down on all the rest of the garbage, getting rid of the alcohol and the carbs and the sugar is probably the biggest thing, focusing mostly on meat, maybe having some things on the side. You're going to make a, a huge difference, and especially if you're just down to sauces and seasonings. Yeah, you're going to be you're doing so much better than everyone else that it's uh, that you'll you'll uh, really f- have a lot of advantages and a lot of benefits. Some people are much more sensitive. Some people have serious health issues. Really, do need to try and be as strict as possible. You'll still get benefits. You'll still get a lot of uh, uh, health uh, benefits from just reducing the other things that you're eating and increasing the amount of meat that you're eating, but. Say for people with autoimmune issues, they are so much more sensitive to these things that they really do just need to be just meat and water. And in fact, most of them do the best on just red meat and water. And I think that has a lot to do with, again, what we were talking about with the animals, what the animals were eating. Ruminant animals like cows, uh, they have these you know four-chambered stomachs and they, they're actually very good at detoxifying things, uh, even if they're not normally meant to eat them. Uh, monogastric animals like us and pigs and chickens, um, they don't have all of that biomechanics and machinery to really detoxify the hell out of these things that they're not supposed to eat. And so they're more sensitive to that. And so because we're the feed that we give a lot of livestock like pigs, like chickens, uh, or things that they don't normally eat, a bunch of like soy pellets and things like that. They're not supposed to eat that. They don't have the biomechanics to break down these things uh, the way they should, and that gets into the meat, and that gets into you. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. That doesn't affect me at all, but someone with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or rheumatoid arthritis, they actually could start having uh, uh, symptoms from that. Um, you know, uh, Michaela Peterson, Jordan Peterson's daughter, she came to a carnivore diet out of desperation, basically. She had such bad rheumatoid arthritis that she had to have two major joint replacements by the time she was 16 years old. So I think it was like her hip and ankle she had to get replaced. That's I mean, that's that's really bad. So her body was just falling apart from, from, a, uh, from a joint perspective. It was breaking down her joints to such a degree that she needed a joint replacement. Not, not even you know, all 80 year olds or 90 year olds needed joint replacement. You know, she needed one at 16. She needed two. And so she found that there were dietary measures that she could, she could impose on herself that, that gave her a lot of benefits. She found those benefits and she worked her way down to a complete elimination diet and just eating meat and water. And all of a sudden she's off all of her medications. She's, um, feeling great. She's not having flare ups, but she notices that basically any plants will give her a flare up. And so this is this is out of necessity that she doesn't eat plants. And she's also noticed that other meats besides besides like red meat, beef, and lamb can actually give her a response. So she she just can't eat pork at all. And she has uh, said before on a, on a on a podcast that she did that if she has any pork, that that will give her as a bad a response as if she like ate fruit or some some plants or something like that. And so she really has to avoid that. So. Some people are going to be more or less sensitive. That's that's you know a, an extreme case. Not most people won't be in that situation, but you know it, it depends on the individual. So if you're having uh, very serious issues, I would recommend really going down bare bones, just meat and water. Any autoimmune issues, just red meat and water for at least three months. Clear your body, clear your system, let your body heal. And then if you want to start adding some things back in, maybe some chicken, beef, pork, dairy, uh, or eggs, you can see how that affects you, you know, in, with the autoimmune class people, uh, really six months, honestly, for, for people with autoimmune is better. Uh, that gives the gut a chance to heal and, and heal up those tight junctions. So you're not going to be letting in a lot of these things that normally don't get in, but in, in people in general, you know, if you don't have a specific health issue, you don't have diabetes, you don't have uh, um, an autoimmune condition or something else, you know, and you want to sort of have some sauces or some seasonings, you know, go for at least a month. I would really recommend three months of, of really just meat and water. And then you start adding in one thing at a time and you see how it affects you. You add, some, you know, add some coffee in or something like that. See how that affects you. And uh, and if it's, if it's not affecting you in, in ways that you really care about, 
fine. You know, you can include that, but but at least you have a clean palette with which to test it against. Um, you know, most people will just get better just eating more meat and eating less of the other garbage. Um, I know a number of, of athletes, rugby players, and and uh, you know, top professionals um, uh, in Australia and the U.S. that do a carnivore diet and and absolutely swear by it, uh, but also ones that aren't quite there, but they're just eating a lot more meat. And they've cut out carbs, they cut out processed crap and uh, and all the different you know sugary stuff and vegetables and things like that. And so they're really just eating meat and maybe they're having some rice before a game or something like that because there's you know they they you know they're still of that mindset that they want to have some carbs before. Yeah, I find that I'm much better without carbs. I talk to a lot of people when they just do strict carnivore diet, they don't need any of that. I actually just had a guy, uh, Tom McDonald, who's an AFL player for like 12 years. Uh, he's in his 12th season in the AFL, the Australian uh, Football League. And he was doing carnivore for a while. He was doing keto for a long time and um, and felt great with that. He did carnivore for like six months. He said he felt you know better than ever, um, but that he would get he would get some like leg cramps and things like that unless he had some some carbs, uh, you know, before a game. And so that's just what he does. He eats just mostly meat, but he'll have a bit of rice uh, before the game because that that seems to help with his cramps. There, I think there are other things that he can do, and I've talked to him about that about what to try in the off season to uh, overcome that. But uh, but even then. You know, just by getting rid of so many other things and just eating mostly on meat, you know, he's he's doing a lot better physically. I know a guy who in America is on the U.S. national team um, for rugby, and he was telling me that his uh, testosterone levels literally doubled in just like three months, <laughs> like going on a carnivore diet. And uh, and he's not even 100%. He's just mostly carnivore. He's eating mostly meat. And he has made this, this and his performance is going up. He's feeling better. It's, testosterone's obviously you know gone way up and so you get a ton of benefit just eating more meat and eating less of the other garbage but yes some people do need to be very strict about it and i just feel the best when i'm when i'm strict as hell and uh, i like feeling my best so that's what i do how do you feel about organ meats we haven't talked about these yet and beyond the carnivore world these have a lot of momentum in the health and wellness space people taking different capsules having liver and whole food form raw cooked is this something I know you don't supplement, but is is whole food liver part of your diet? You know, I, I don't eat much organs. You know, I think there. You know, if you're if you're eating like a standard diet or you know more plant based diet or coming from you know uh, one of those, uh, liver is probably your best friend. It's very nutrient dense. It has a lot of these things. It can catch you up. It's just just a vitamin in an organ. It's and it's you know, very bioavailable. It has, has a lot of very good things and it's very available to us. You, you take a pill, you're not really, you're peeing out most of that, but you're also just pooping out most of that because you're not absorbing a lot of it. So there's that bio, that idea of bioavailability that's very important. Liver is very bioavailable. You get, you get most of that out of, of, of the liver. Um, I don't think you have to have it. You know, I, I've tested my bloods. I've tested my vitamins and, and things like that you years into a carnivore diet just just beef and water mostly uh not really eating any organs and like i said you know my my levels were in that optimal range of someone that we'd seen in their mid 20s that that is in uh, good health so i i don't think you need it i know the inuits uh traditionally don't eat the organs and the polar explorers that went up and lived with them there's a professor of ethnology at harvard 100 years ago wilhelmer stefansson who wrote a book called the fat of the land and he lived with the inuits for 10 years or sorry 12 years and uh and and ate as they did and went like wow there's something to this we should look into this and so he he promoted an all meat diet a high fat meat diet and you know and he would say specifically you don't need organs. We never ate organs. The Inuit didn't eat organs. Uh, in fact, you know, marine or marine, the organs of a marine mammal is probably you shouldn't eat because it's such a high vitamin A content, like in the liver, that it can kill you. You can get hypervitaminosis, and um, you know, uh, you know, one of the, the best examples of that is the polar bear liver has so much vitamin A it will just kill you. you. You really can't eat any of it. It's very toxic because of the vitamin A. Um, I don't think that you have to ever eat it out of proportion of the animal. You know, if we're, if we're thinking biologically, if we're thinking, you know, what happens in nature, then you hunt an animal, you take it down, you, you take down a bison or something like that. And that's a big, massive, strong animal. 
And that's probably going to feed, you know, you or I as an individual for two years. And it has one liver. It's a big liver, but there's only one of it. And so you're going to have, you know, 100, 200 times the amount of, of skeletal muscle meat and fat to that liver. Um, and so I think you just keep that in proportion. I don't think you have to do it. Um, I've had liver three times in the last decade. And so, you know, it's not something that I, that I go after, but you know, if you want some liver, you have some liver. If it tastes good, I think that's a good sign that your body probably wants some of it. I, of those three times that I've had liver, um, uh, first of all, raw liver tastes way better than cooked liver. That is something that I learned. <laughs> and, uh, and I did the same thing where I lightly salted it, you know, put thin strips on the drying racks I let it dry out for a few days and I found that it sort of dried out the texture. It wasn't, you know, slimy and, um, and it was sort of gummy. It was sort of a gummy, chewy liver candy. It was, it was actually delicious. And like, I really like, I really like gummy candies. That's probably one of the only things I miss is that just that, that tactile experience of chewing on a gummy candy, like a gummy bear or something like that. And the, uh, the, the liver dried out for probably like four days had that, that consistency had that texture. So it was like this gummy candy. I'm like, that's amazing. But it tasted like meat. So it was this meat gummy. I'm like, this is perfect. You know, that's exactly what I want. And, you know, so I'd have a piece of that. I'm like, mm, I want another one. Mm, I want another one. And I'm like, eh, I don't really want another one after that. So it's that same thing. You're just listening to your body. You're listening to your taste. And it's like, that's tasting really good. That's tasting really good. And like, yeah, yeah, it's not really tasting great anymore. And so I just, I just stopped the next day. I'd have another couple pieces and things like that. And then, you know, when I was sort of done with it, I was just like, yeah, I don't really want to do that again. So my body was happy with the amount of nutrients that I got. Um, and I uh, could go from there. There are some people that are going to metabolize vitamins and minerals and nutrients slightly different than other people. And so maybe they need a bit like, like full, I, I have more than enough folate, um, because of what I'm eating, but I've, I've come across, you know, two people personally now that have had lower folates and there's something you would see in the forum. Some people have having a bit lower folate. Those people probably do need to incorporate some liver in their, in their diet because, uh, there's, there's a lot more folate in the liver. So I don't think you need to take any supplements or anything, do anything special unless you have a, a diagnosed deficiency, you know, and again, you know, the animals that we, we evolved eating, we're eating what they were supposed to eat on very rich, fertile land. And so the nutrient profile was very different as well. And so maybe for some people, it's just not quite enough to do that with store-bought mu uh, skeletal muscle meat and fat. Maybe you need to go to the organs as well. And that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and then maybe other people for some reason have a bit of a deficiency in one thing or the other. Um, and, and in which case, you know, I think supplementation is fine in, in those in those cases, um, if liver is not enough and you need to take a specific, you know, vitamin D or zinc or something like that, fine. I don't think there's a big deal with that. As, as long as you actually need it, I don't think anyone needs to take a supplement that they, that they don't actually have it, of something that they're not actually deficient in. And so, uh, just check, just check your bloods. And if, if, uh, you know, beef is not enough and you add in liver, uh, and that does the job, great. And if liver's not quite enough and you need to take a pill, take a pill. That's not a big deal. Earlier, you talked about the difference between having optimal ranges of labs versus standard. When you're eating this amount of meat, have you ever had the problem of B12 going too high or iron going too high and having to moderate or change up the way you're eating? No. And, and specifically in the context of that optimal range, right? Because if, if we were looking at the the lab ranges, yes, I would definitely be too high. And so, uh, but that's, but that's, uh, fine. I want to be higher than, than the, the reference ranges that they use specifically for B12. B12 is one that, um, most people are deficient in. And because of that, the reference ranges reflect that they reflect deficiency. And so the range for most, most reference ranges for B12 in most countries, Actually, the lower end is well below deficiency levels. So uh, here it's um, picograms per milliliter, and the reference range is about 130 you know, something. Depending on you know, every lab has a different different reference range because uh, it's, it's just a different community uh, and different population, right? And so about 130 
uh, picograms per milliliter to about 620 picograms per milliliter. That's that's a, a rough range, and it's and it's a similar sort of range in in America and and uh, Canada. You know, in in the, the units that that are used there. So that below 400 is actually um, vitamin B12 deficiency. There's there's studies showing that you can actually get demyelination of your of your of the axons of your nerves and uh, and neurological damage with lower level lower than 400 uh, picograms per milliliter so that's a, that's a deficiency and yet between 130 and four and 600 is 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 normal right so 100 you know there's, there's 250 points in there that um, uh, that are that are, are considered normal right so you can have someone you know go in and your doctor doesn't know this uh, about the reference ranges and then you say oh yeah your your b12 is 300 yeah you're fine you know, say oh, i'm kind of tired i don't really feel great this and the other. Mm, well let's check your b12 and like oh look at that well your b12 is normal so you no know, that's not a problem and uh and and mi- you're missing out on an actual deficiency um so a better range that we would see in young healthy adults is uh, 800 to 1200. So even the what I would say is the lower end of where you want for good health is actually 150 points above the upper limit for uh, the reference range because the reference ranges are the average for the community. It's not the range of good health. And that's a very important distinction. And so, you know, with folate or iron and all these sorts of things, again, people are chronically iron deficient. They're chronically uh, uh, deficient in these different vitamins and minerals. And so having slightly higher than those reference ranges is actually a good idea. Um, there are doctors that that do have a better understanding of the optimal reference ranges. And uh, you can probably find them usually under the name of uh, preventative medicine, functional medicine, metabolic health sort of those sorts of clinics will be um you know they'll they'll probably be more uh in tune with the actual you know reference ranges that that of, of good health as opposed to just the community and so my my levels are pretty much in those levels for a 25 year old not not everything you know but um but they're close and they're a lot better than than most people Anthony, you've been super generous with your time. I really appreciate that. Before we wrap up, I want to end on this. And it just, you talked about the gummies, the liver being like a gummy candy. It got me thinking about snacking. So say you're a really busy guy, so I don't know how often this happens, but say on a Saturday night, you and your girlfriend are watching a movie and you want to have a snack on a carnivore diet. What does that look like? Or do you ever snack? I, I generally think that if you're hungry enough to snack, you, you're probably hungry enough to to eat, and so you should just you should just eat and have a meal. Um, but if you know, uh, and that, I think that that's it's probably a good way of, of leaving it. You know, is just if you're if you're sort of snacking and eating just because you're bored, probably not a good idea. Um, but there are snacks, there are things that you can have that are just sort of fun. Uh, like biltong is a South African sort of jerky that they just sort of dry out and they sort of cut against the grain. So it's very easy to chew. Sometimes it's soft. It's not completely dry and hard. Um, that's delicious. And, uh, it's like, it's just meat popcorn sort of thing. So you can have a bag of, of biltong and, and watch a movie. Um, and, uh, you know, you could do even do like steak bites and things like that. I generally just eat though. Um, probably the only thing we snack would be like, like a treat would be like, I get some biltong or called dry wars, which is uh, dry wars, which is, dried sausage. And this is, again, um, they do a lot of these in South Africa. Um, and I get, I get ones that don't have a bunch of spices and seasonings. I want, I like ones that just have salt. And so it's just meat, fat, and salt. And, uh, and so you can sort of snack on that, but generally, generally I just, um, you know, I just eat until I'm full and then I'm just not hungry. And I don't think about food after that. Love the conversation, Anthony. We're going to link up your YouTube channel, your social media, everything in the show notes. Thank you for coming on the show. I really enjoyed this, learned a lot, and really appreciate your time. Well, not a problem at all. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Now that you're done my conversation with Anthony, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Barry. He's a medical doctor who eats a carnivore diet. There's a lot more to learn from him. I'll see you over there. I know that you've tried. I know that you've, you've really put in the effort, but you were given the wrong information.